Blessed Memory From the Pleasures of Memory by Samuel Rogers From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao Blessed Memory Ethereal power, who at the noon of night Recoursed the far-fled spirit of delight, From whom that musing, melancholy mood which charms the wise and elevates the good. Blessed memory, hail, O oh, grant the grateful muse, her pencil dipped in nature's living hues, to pass the clouds that round thy empire roll, and trace its airy precincts in the soul. Lulled in the countless chambers of the brain, our thoughts are linked by many a hidden chain. Awake but one, and lo, what myriads rise, each stamps its image as the other flies. Each as the various avenues of sense, delight or sorrow to the soul dispense, brightens or fades, yet all with magic art, control the latent fibres of the heart. As studious Prospero's mysterious spell drew every subject's spirit to his cell, each at thy call advances or retires, as judgment dictates, or the scene inspires. Each thrills the seat of sense, that sacred source whence the fine nerves direct their mazy course, and through the frame invisibly convey the subtle, quick vibrations as they play. Hail, memory, hail, in thy exhaustless mine, from age to age unnumbered treasures shine. Thought and her shadowy brood thy call obey, and place and time are subject to thy sway. Thy pleasures most we feel when most alone, the only pleasures we can call our own. Lighter than air, hope's summer visions die, if but a fleeting cloud obscure the sky. If but a beam of sober reason play, lo, fancy's fairy frostwork melts away. But can the wiles of art, the grasp of power, snatch the rich relics of a well-spent hour? These when the trembling spirit wings her flight, Pour round her path a stream of living light, And gild those pure and perfect realms of rest, Where virtue triumphs, and her sons are blessed. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sudden Light by Dante Gabriel Rossetti From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6 Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter Sudden Light I have been here before, but when or how I cannot tell. I know the grass beyond the door, the sweet keen smell, the sighing sound, the lights around the shore. You have been mine before. How long ago I may not know. But just when at that swallow's soar, your neck turned so, some veil did fall. I knew it all of yore. Has this been thus before? And shall not thus time's eddying flight still with our lives our love restore, in death's despite, and day and night yield one delight once more? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Pre-Existence by Paul Hamilton Hayne From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6 Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter Pre-Existence While sauntering through the crowded street, Some half-remembered face I meet albeit upon no mortal shore that face methinks has smiled before lost in a gay and festal throng i tremble at some tender song set to an air whose golden bars i must have heard in other stars in sacred aisles i pause to share the blessings of a priestly prayer when the whole scene which greets mine eyes in some strange mode I recognize As one whose every mystic part I feel prefigured in my heart. At sunset, 
as I calmly stand, a stranger on an alien strand, familiar as my childhood's home, seems a long stretch of wave and foam. One sails toward me o'er the bay, and what he comes to do and say I can foretell. A prescient lore springs from some life outlived of yore. O oh, swift, instinctive, startling gleams of deep soul knowledge, not as dreams, for I he vaguely dawn and die, but oft with lightning certainty pierce through the dark, oblivious brain to make old thoughts and memories plain, thoughts which perchance must travel back across the wild, bewildering track of countless eons, Memories far, high-reaching as yon pallid star, Unknown, scarce seen, whose flickering grace Faints on the outmost rings of space. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Once Before by Mary Mapes Dodge from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part two read for librivox.org by sonia once before once before this self-same air passed me though i know not where strange how very like it came touch and fragrance were the same sound of mingled voices too with a light laugh ringing through someone moving here or there someone passing up the stair someone calling from without or a far-off childish shout simple home-like nothing more yet it all hath been before no not to-day nor yesterday nor any day but far away so long ago so very far it might have been on other star how was it spent and where and when this life that went yet comes again was sleep its world or death its shore i still the silent past implore ah never dream had power to show such vexing glimpse of long ago never a death could follow death with love between and home and breath the spell has passed what spendthrifts we of simple household certainty what golden grain we trample low searching for flowers that never grow why home is real and love is real nor false our honest high ideal life it is bounding warm and strong and all my heart resounds with song it must be true whatever befall this and the world to come are all and yet it puzzles me alack when life that could not be comes back end of poem this recording is in the public domain a lost chord by adelaide ann proctor from the world's best poetry volume six Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao A Lost Chord Seated one day at the organ, I was weary and ill at ease, And my fingers wandered idly over the noisy keys. I do not know what I was playing, or what I was dreaming then, But I struck one chord of music, like the sound of a great Amen. It flooded the crimson twilight, like the close of an angel's psalm, and it lay on my fevered spirit with a touch of infinite calm. It quieted pain and sorrow, like love overcoming strife. It seemed the harmonious echo from our discordant life. It linked all perplexed meanings into one perfect peace, and trembled away into silence as if it were loath to seize. I have sought, but I seek it vainly, that one lost chord divine, that came from the soul of the organ, and entered into mine. It may be that death's bright angel will speak in that chord again. 
it may be that only in heaven I shall hear that grand amen. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Closing Year by George Denison Prentice From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin The Closing Year Tis midnight's holy hour, and silence now is brooding Like a gentle spirit o'er the still and pulseless world Hark on the winds, the bell's deep tones are swelling. Tis the knell of the departed year, no funeral train is sweeping past, yet on the stream and wood, with melancholy light, the moonbeams rest like a pale, spotless shroud. The air is stirred as by a mourner's sigh, and on yon cloud that floats so still and placidly through heaven, the spirits of the seasons seem to stand young spring bright summer autumn's solemn form and winter with its aged locks and breath in mournful cadences that come abroad like the far wind harps wild and touching wail a melancholy dirge or the dead year gone from the earth for ever tis a time for memory and for tears within the deep still chambers of the heart a spectre dim, whose tones are like the wizard's voice of time, heard from the tomb of ages, points its cold and solemn finger to the beautiful and holy visions that have passed away, and left no shadow of their loveliness on the dead waste of life. That spectre lifts the coffin lid of hope and joy and love, and bending mournfully above the pale, sweet forms that slumber there, scatters dead flowers o'er oh, what has passed to nothingness the year has gone and with it many a glorious throng of happy dreams its mark is on each brow its shadow in each heart in its swift course it waved its sceptre o'er the beautiful and they are not upon the strong man and the haughty form is fallen and the flashing eye is dim it trod the hall of revelry where thronged the bright and joyous and the tearful wail of stricken ones is heard where erst the song and reckless shout resounded it passed o'er the battle plain where sword and spear and shield flashed in the light of midday and the strength of serried hosts is shivered and the grass green from the soil of carnage waves above the crushed and mouldering skeleton it came and faded like a wreath of mist at eve yet ere it melted in the viewless air it heralded its millions to their home in the dim land of dreams remorseless time fierce spirit of the glass and scythe what power can stay him in his silent course or melt his iron heart to pity on still on he presses and for ever the proud bird, the condor of the Andes, that can soar through heaven's unfathomable depths, or brave the fury of the northern hurricane, and bathe his plumage in the thunder's home, furls his broad wings at nightfall, and sinks down to rest upon his mountain crag, but time knows not the weight of sleep or weariness, and night's deep darkness has no chain to bind his rushing pinions. Revolutions sweep o'er the earth like troubled visions o'er the breast of dreaming sorrow. Cities rise and sink like bubbles on the water. Fiery isles spring blazing from the ocean and go back to their mysterious caverns. Mountains rear to heaven their bald and blackened cliffs and bow their tall heads to the plain. New empires rise, gathering the strengths of hoary centuries, and rush down like the alpine avalanche, startling the nations and the very stars. Yon bright and burning blazonry of God glitter awhile in their eternal depths, and, 
like the Pleiades, loveliest of their train, shoot from their glorious spheres and pass away to darkle in the trackless void. Yet time, time the tomb builder, holds his fierce career dark, stern, all pitiless, and pauses not amid the mighty wrecks that strew his path to sit and muse like other conquerors upon the fearful ruin he has wrought. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Roma by Giosuè Carducci Translated from Italian by Frank Sewell From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada Roma From Poesy Give to the wind thy locks, all glittering thy sea-blue eyes, and thy white bosom bared mount to thy chariot while in speechless roaring terror and force before thee clear the way the shadow of thy helmet like the flashing of brazen star strikes through the trembling air the dust of broken empires cloud-like rising follows the awful rumbling of thy wheels so once o rome beheld the conquered nations thy image object of their ancient dread today a mitre they would place upon thy head and fold a rosary between thy hands o name again to terrors old awake the tired ages and the world end of poem this recording is in the public domain There is such power, from Sonnets in Shadow, by Arlo Bates, from The World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2, read for LibriVox.org, by Lian Yao. There is such power. There is such power, even in smallest things, to bring the dear past back, a flower's tint, a snatch of some old song, the fleeting glint of sunbeams on the wave. Each vivid brings the lost days up, as from the idle strings of wind harp, sad a breeze evokes the hint of antique tunes. A glove which keeps imprint of a loved hand, the heart with torture rings. By memory of a clasp meant more than speech, a face seen in the crowd with curve of cheek, or sweep of eyelash, our woe's core can reach. How strong is love to yearn, and yet how weak to strive with fate, the lesson all things teach, as of the past in myriad ways they speak. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Verses, supposed to be written by Alexander Selkirk during his solitary abode in the island of Juan Fernandez by William Cooper. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. Verses. Supposed to be written by Alexander Selkirk during his solitary abode in the island of Juan Fernandez. I am monarch of all I survey. My right there is none to dispute. From the center all round to the sea, I am lord of the fowl and the brute. O oh, solitude, where are the charms that sages have seen in thy face? Better dwell in the midst of alarms than reign in this horrible place. I am out of humanity's reach. I must finish my journey alone. Never hear the sweet music of speech. I start at the sound of my own. The beasts that roam over the plain, my form with indifference see. They are so unacquainted with man, their tameness is shocking to me. Society, friendship, and love, divinely bestowed upon man. Oh, had I the wings of a dove, 
how soon would I taste you again? My sorrows I then might assuage in the ways of religion and truth, might learn from the wisdom of age and be cheered by the sallies of youth. Religion, what treasure untold resides in that heavenly word, more precious than silver and gold or all that this earth can afford. For the sound of the church-going bell these valleys and rocks never heard, never sighed at the sound of a knell, or smiled when a Sabbath appeared. Ye winds that have made me your sport, convey to this desolate shore some cordial, endearing report of a land I shall visit no more. My friends, do they now and then send a wish or a thought after me? Oh, tell me I yet have a friend, though a friend I am never to see. How fleet is a glance of the mind, compared with the speed of its flight. The tempest itself lags behind, and the swift-winged arrows of light. When I think of my own native land, in a moment I seem to be there. But alas! Recollection at hand soon hurries me back to despair. But the sea fowl is gone to her nest, the beast is laid down in his lair. Even here is a season of rest, and I to my cabin repair. There's mercy in every place, and mercy, encouraging thought, gives even affliction a grace and reconciles man to his lot. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Mignon's Song by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe Translated from German by Thomas Carlyle From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia Mignon's Song from Wilhelm Meister Knowest thou the land where citron apples bloom And oranges like gold in leafy gloom A gentle wind from deep blue heaven blows The myrtle thick and high the laurel grows Knowest thou it then? Tis there, tis there, O oh, my true loved one, thou with me must go Knowest thou the house its porch with pillars tall, the rooms do glitter, glitters bright the hall, and marble statues stand and look each one. What's this, poor child, to thee they've done? Knowest thou it then? Tis there, tis there, O oh, my protector, thou with me must go. Knowest thou the hill, the bridge that hangs on cloud, the mules in mist grope over the torrent loud? In caves lie coiled the dragon's ancient brood, the crag leaps down, and over it the flood. Knowest thou it then? Tis there, tis there, our way runs. O oh, my father, wilt thou go? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Oft in the stilly night by Thomas Moore, from the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2, read for LibriVox.org, by Sonia. Oft in the stilly night, oft in the stilly night, ere slumber's chain has bound me, fond memory brings the light of other days around me, the smiles, the tears of boyhood's years, the words of love then spoken, the eyes that shone, now dimmed and gone, the cheerful hearts now broken. Thus, in the stilly night, ere slumber's chain has bound me, sad memory brings the light of other days around me. When I remember all the friends so linked together I've seen around me fall, like leaves in wintry weather, I feel like one who treads alone 
some banquet hall deserted whose lights are fled whose garlands dead and all but he departed thus in the stilly night ere slumber's chain has bound me sad memory brings the light of other days around me end of poem this recording is in the public domain on the ruins of a country inn by philip freno from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part two read for LibriVox.org by craig franklin on the ruins of a country inn where now these mingled ruins lie a temple once to bacchus rose beneath whose roof aspiring high full many a guest forgot his woes no more this dome by tempests torn affords a social safe retreat but ravens here with eyes forlorn and clustering bats henceforth will meet the priestess of this ruined shrine unable to survive the stroke presents no more the ruddy wine her glass is gone her china broke the friendly host whose social hand accosted strangers at the door has left at length his wonted stand and greets the weary guest no more old creeping time that brings decay might yet have spared these mouldering walls alike beneath whose potent sway a temple or a tavern falls is this the place where mirth and joy coy nymphs and sprightly lads were found indeed no more the nymphs are coy no more the flowing bowls go round is this the place where festive song deceived the wintry hours away no more the swains that tune prolong no more the maidens join the lay is this the place where nancy slept in downy beds of blue and green dame nature here no vigils kept no cold unfeeling guards were seen tis gone and nancy tempts no more deep unrelenting silence reigns of all that pleased that charmed before the tottering chimney scarce remains ye tyrant winds whose ruffian blast through doors and windows blew too strong and all the roof to ruin cast the roof that sheltered us so long your wrath appeased i pray be kind if mopsus should the dome renew that we again may quaff his wine again collect our jovial crew end of poem this recording is in the public domain tis but a little faded flower by ellen clementine howarth from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part two read for librivox dot org by lian yao tis but a little faded flower tis but a little faded flower but oh how fondly dear twill bring me back one golden hour through many a weary year i may not to the world impart the secret of its power but treasured in my inmost heart i keep my faded flower where is the heart that doth not keep within its inmost core some fond remembrance hidden deep of days that are no more who hath not saved some trifling thing more prized than jewels rare a faded flower a broken ring a tress of golden hair end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Briarwood Pipe by Charles Dawson Shanley From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6 Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter as the narrator And Lian Yao as the Briarwood The Briarwood Pipe Ha! Bully for me again When my turn for picket is over And now for a smoke as I lie with the moonlight out in the clover my pipe 
It's only a knot from the root of a briarwood tree, but it turns my heart to the northward. Harry gave it to me. And I'm but a rough at best, bred up to the row and the riot. But a softness comes over my heart when all are asleep and quiet. For, many a time, in the night, strange things appear to my eye, as the breath from my briarwood pipe curls up between me and the sky. Last night, a beautiful spirit arose with the wisping smoke. Oh, I shook, but my heart felt good, as it spread out its hands and spoke, saying, I am the soul of the briar. We grew at the root of a tree, where lovers would come in the twilight, two ever for company. Where lovers would come in the morning, ever but two together, when the flowers were full in their blow, the birds in their song and feather. Where lovers would come in the noontide, loitering, never but two, looking in each other's eyes, like pigeons that kiss and coo. And oh, the honeyed words that came when the lips were parted, and the passion that glowed in the eyes, and the lightning looks that darted. Enough, love dwells in the pipe, so ever it glows with fire. I am the soul of the bush, and the spirits call me Sweet Briar. That's what the Briarwood said, as nigh as my tongue can tell, and the words went straight to my heart, like the stroke of the fire bell. Tonight I lie in the clover, watching the blossomy smoke. I'm glad the boys are asleep, for I ain't in the humor to joke. I lie in the hefty clover, up between me and the moon, the smoke of my pipe arises. My heart will be quiet soon. My thoughts are back in the city. I'm everything I've been. I hear the bell from the tower. I run with the swift machine. I see the red shirts crowding around the engine house door. The foreman's hail through the trumpet comes with a hollow roar. The reel in the bowery dance house. The row in the beer saloon. Where I put in my licks at Big Paul. Come between me and the moon. I hear the drum and the bugle. The tramp of the cowskin boots. We are marching on our muscle. The fires who wave recruits. White handkerchiefs wave before me. Oh, but the sight is pretty on the white marble steps as we march through the heart of the city. Bright eyes and clasping arms and lips that bade us good hap and the splendid lady who gave me the havelock for my cap. Oh, up from my pipe cloud rises, there between me and the moon, a beautiful white-robed lady. My heart will be quiet soon. The lovely golden-haired lady ever in dreams I see, who gave me the snow-white havelock. But what does she care for me? Look at my grimy features. Mountains between us stand. I with my sledgehammer knuckles, she with her jeweled hand. What care I? The day that's dawning may see me, when all is over, with the red stream of my lifeblood staining the hefty clover. Hark, the reveille sounding out on the morning air. Devils are we for the battle. Will there be angels there? Kiss me again, sweet briar. The touch of your lip to mine brings back the white-robed lady with hair like the golden wine. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Memory and Oblivion by Macedonius Translated from Greek by Robert Bland From The World's Best Poetry, Volume 6 Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao Memory and Oblivion All hail, remembrance and forgetfulness Trace memory, trace whate'er is sweet or kind When friends forsake us or misfortunes press Oblivion, raise the record from our mind. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
The Inner Vision by William Wordsworth From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada The Inner Vision Most sweet it is with unuplifted eyes to pace the ground, if path there be or none, while a fair region round the traveller lies, which he forbears again to look upon. Pleased rather with some soft ideal scene, the work of fancy, or some happy tone of meditation, slipping in between the beauty coming and the beauty gone. If thought and love desert us, from that day let us break off all commerce with the muse, with thought and love companions of our way, whate'er the senses take or may refuse, the mind's internal heaven shall shed her dews of inspiration on the humblest lay. William Wordsworth End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Thought by Christopher Pierce Crench From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia Thought Thought is deeper than all speech, Feeling deeper than all thought. Souls to souls can never teach What unto themselves was taught. We are spirits clad in veils, man by man was never seen. All our deep communing fails to remove the shadowy screen. Heart to heart was never known, mind with mind did never meet. We are columns left alone of a temple once complete. Like the stars that gem the sky, far apart, though seeming near in our light we scattered lie all is thus but starlight here what is social company but a babbling summer stream what our wise philosophy but the glancing of a dream only when the sun of love melts the scattered stars of thought only when we live above what the dim-eyed world hath taught only when our souls are fed by the fount which gave them birth and by inspiration led which they never drew from earth we like parted drops of rain swelling till they meet and run shall be all absorbed again melting flowing into one end of poem this recording is in the public domain Dream Life from Such Stuff as Dreams Are Made Of by Pedro Calderon Translated from the Spanish by Edward Fitzgerald From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6 Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter Dream Life from Such Stuff as Dreams Are Made Of And yet, and yet, in these our ghostly lives, half night, half day, half sleeping, half awake, how if our waking life, like that of sleep, be all a dream in that eternal life, to which we wake not till we sleep in death? How if, I say, the senses we now trust, for date of sensible comparison, I, even the reason's self that dates with them, should be an essence of intensity, hereafter so transcended, and awoke to a perceptive subtlety so keen, as to confess themselves befooled before, in all that now they will avouch for most. One man, like this, but only so much longer, as life is longer than a summer's day, believed himself a king upon his throne, and played at hazard with his fellows' lives, who cheaply dreamed away their lives to him. 
the sailor dreamed of tossing on the flood, the soldier of his laurels grown in blood, the lover of the beauty that he knew must yet dissolve to dusty residue, the merchant and the miser of his bags of fingered gold, the beggar of his rags, and all this stage of earth on which we seem such busy actors, and the parts we played substantial as the shadow of a shade, and dreaming but a dream within a dream. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. My Minde to Me a Kingdom is by Sir Edward Dyer From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia my mind to me a kingdom is my mind to me a kingdom is such perfect joy therein i find as far exceeds all earthly bliss that god or nature hath assigned though much i want that most would have yet still my mind forbids to crave content i live this is my stay I seek no more than may suffice. I press to bear no haughty sway. Look, what I lack, my mind supplies. Lo, thus I triumph like a king, Content with that my mind doth bring. I see how plenty surfeits oft, And hasty climbers soon do fall. I see that such as sit aloft Mishap doth threaten most of all. These get with toil, they keep with fear. Such cares my mind could never bear. No princely pomp, nor wealthy store, No force to win the victory, No wily wit to salve a sore, No shape to win a lover's eye. To none of these I yield as thrall, for why, my mind despiseth all. Some have too much, yet still they crave, I little have, yet seek no more. They are but poor, though much they have, And I am rich with little store. They poor, I rich, they beg, I give, They lack, I lend, they pine, I live. I laugh not at another's loss, I grudge not at another's gain, No worldly wave my mind can toss, I brook that is another's bane. I fear no foe, I fawn no friend, I loathe not life, nor dread mine end. I joy not in no earthly bliss, I weigh not Croesus' wealth a straw, For care, I care not what it is, I fear not fortune's fatal law. My mind is such as may not move for beauty bright or force of love. I wish but what I have at will, I wander not to seek for more. I like the plain, I climb no hill, in greatest storms I sit on shore, and laugh at them that toil in vain to get what must be lost again. I kiss not where I wish to kill, I feign not love where most I hate, I break no sleep to win my will, I wait not at the mightiest gate, I scorn no poor, I fear no rich, I feel no want, nor have too much. The court knee card I like knee loathe, Extremes are counted worst of all. The golden mean betwixt them both Doth surest sit and fears no fall. This is my choice, for why I find No wealth is like a quiet mind. My wealth is health and perfect ease, My conscience clear, my chief defence. I neither seek by bribes to please, nor by desert to breed offence. Thus do I live, thus will I die, 
would all did so as well as i end of poem this recording is in the public domain to one who had scoffed at the poet's poverty from the latin of marshall from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part two read for LibriVox.org by craig franklin to one who had scoffed at the poet's poverty yes i am poor calistratus i own and so was ever yet not quite unknown graced with a knight's degree nor this alone but through the world my verse is often sung and that is he sounds buzzed from every tongue and what to few when dust the fates assign in bloom and freshness of my days is mine thy ceilings on a hundred columns rest wealth as of upstart freedmen bursts thy chest nile flows in fatness o'er thy ample fields cis alpine gore thy silky fleeces yields lo such thou art and such am i like me calistratus thou canst not hope to be a hundred of the crowd resemble thee end of poem this recording is in the public domain of a contented spirit by thomas lord vaux from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part two read for librivox dot org by jason in canada of a contented spirit when all is done and said in the end this you shall find he most of all doth bathe in bliss that hath a quiet mind and clear from worldly cares to dream can be content the sweetest time in all this life in thinking to be spent the body subject is to fickle fortune's power and to a million of mishaps is casual every hour and death in time doth change it to a clod of clay when as the mind which is divine runs never to decay companion none is like unto the mind alone for many have been harmed by speech through thinking few or none fear oftentimes restraineth words but makes not thought to cease and he speaks best that hath the skill when for to hold his peace our wealth leaves us at death our kinsmen at the grave but virtues of the mind unto the heavens with us we have wherefore for virtue's sake i can be well content the sweetest time of all my life to deem in thinking spent thomas lord vaux end of poem this recording is in the public domain a thing of beauty is a joy forever from endymion book one by john keats from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part two read for librivox dot org by craig franklin a thing of beauty is a joy for ever a thing of beauty is a joy for ever its loveliness increases it will never pass into nothingness but still will keep a bower quiet for us and a sleep full of sweet dreams and health and quiet breathing therefore on every morrow are we wreathing a flowery band to bind us to the earth spite of despondence of the inhuman dearth of noble natures of the gloomy days of all the unhealthy and awe darkened ways made for our searching yes in spite of all some shape of beauty moves away the pall from our dark spirits such the sun the moon trees old and young sprouting a shady boon for simple sheep and such are daffodils with the green world they live in and clear rills that for themselves a cooling covert make gainst the hot season the mid-forest break 
rich with a sprinkling of fair musk-rose blooms and such too is the grandeur of the dooms we have imagined for the mighty dead all lovely tales that we have heard or read an endless fountain of immortal drink pouring unto us from the heaven's brink end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Sower and His Seed by William E. H. Lecky From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada The Sower and His Seed He planted an oak in his father's park and a thought in the minds of men, and he bade farewell to his native shore, which he never will see again. O oh, merrily stream the tourist throng to the glow of the southern sky. A vision of pleasure beckons them on, but he went there to die. The oak will grow, and its boughs will spread, and many rejoice in its shade. But none will visit the distant grave where a stranger youth is laid. And the thought will live when the oak has died, and quicken the minds of men. But the name of the thinker has vanished away, and will never be heard again. William E. H. Lecky End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Aesop by Andrew Lang From The World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Leanne Yao as the narrator, Thomas Peter as Aesop, and Craig Franklin as the animals. Aesop. He sat among the woods. He heard the sylvan merriment. He saw the pranks of butterfly and bird, the humours of the ape, the daw. And in the lion or the frog, in all the life of moor and fen, in ass and peacock, stork and dog, he read similitudes of men. Of these from those, he cried, we come, our hearts, our brains descend from these. And lo, the beasts no more were dumb, but answered out of brakes and trees. Not ours, they cried. Degenerate, if ours at all, they cried again. Ye fools who war with God and fate, who strive and toil, strange race of men. For we are neither bond nor free, For we have neither slaves nor kings, But near to nature's heart are we, Unconscious of her secret things. Content are we to fall asleep, And well content to wake no more. We do not laugh, we do not weep, Nor look behind us and before. But were there cause for moan or mirth, Tis we, not you, should sigh your scorn, O latest children of the earth most childish children earth has borne they spoke but that misshapen slave told never of the thing he heard and unto men their portraits gave in likenesses of beast and bird end of poem this recording is in the public domain in direction by richard rilf from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part two read for librivox dot org by sonia in direction fair are the flowers and the children but their subtle suggestion is fairer rare is the rose burst of dawn but the secret that clasps it is rarer sweet the exultance of song but the strain that precedes it is sweeter and never was poem yet writ but the meaning outmastered the meter never a daisy that grows but a mystery guideth the growing never a river that flows but a majesty sceptres the flowing never a shakespeare that soared but a stronger than he did enfold him nor ever a prophet foretells 
but a mightier seer hath foretold him back of the canvas that throbs the painter is hinted and hidden into the statue that breathes the soul of the sculptor is bidden under the joy that is felt lie the infinite issues of feeling crowning the glory revealed is the glory that crowns the revealing great are the symbols of being but that which is symboled is greater vast the create and beheld but vaster the inward creator back of the sound broods the silence back of the gift stands the giving back of the hand that receives thrill the sensitive nerves of receiving space is as nothing to spirit the deed is outdone by the doing the heart of the wooer is warm but warmer the heart of the wooing and up from the pits where these shiver and up from the heights where those shine twin voices and shadows swim starward and the essence of life is divine end of poem this recording is in the public domain proem by madison cowain from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part two read for LibriVox.org by thomas peter proem there is no rhyme that is half so sweet as the song of the wind in the rippling wheat there is no meter that's half so fine as the lilt of the brook under rock and vine and the loveliest lyric i ever heard was the wild wood strain of a forest bird if the wind and the brook and the bird would teach my heart their beautiful parts of speech and the natural art that they say these with my soul would sing of beauty and myth in a rhyme and a meter that none before have sung in their love or dreamed in their lore and the world would be richer one poet the more end of poem this recording is in the public domain the poet of nature from festus by philip james bailey from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part two read for librivox .org by craig franklin the poet of nature he had no times of study and no place all places and all times to him were one his soul was like the wind harp which he loved and sounded only when the spirit blew sometime in feasts and follies for he went lifelike through all things and his thoughts then rose like sparkles in the bright wine brighter still sometimes in dreams and then the shining words would wake him in the dark before his face all things talked thoughts to him the sea went mad to show his meaning and the awful sun thundered his thoughts into him and at night the stars would whisper theirs the moon sigh hers end of poem this recording is in the public domain above the clouds by joaquin miller from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part two Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada Above the Clouds Mid white sierras that slope to the sea lie turbulent lands. Go dwell in the skies, and the thundering tongues of Yosemite shall persuade you to silence, and you shall be wise. I but sing for the love of song and the few who loved me first, 
and shall love me last and the storm shall pass as the storms have passed for never were clouds but the sun came through joaquin miller end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Poet's Impulse From Child Harold's Pilgrimage, Canto Three, by Lord Byron From the World's Best Poetry, Volume Six, Fancy and Sentiment, Part Two Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin The Poet's Impulse Sky, mountains, river, winds, lake, lightnings, Ye with night and clouds and thunder and a soul, to make these felt and feeling well may be things that have made me watchful the far roll of your departing voices is the knoll of what in me is sleepless if i rest but where of ye o tempests is the goal are ye like those within the human breast or do ye find at length like eagles some high nest could i embody and unbosom now that which is most within me could i wreak my thoughts upon expression and thus throw soul heart mind passions feelings strong or weak all that i would have sought and all i seek bear know feel and yet breathe into one word and that one word were lightning i would speak but as it is i live and die unheard with a most voiceless thought sheathing it as a sword. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Impression by Edmund Goss From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Impression In these restrained and careful times, Our knowledge petrifies our rhymes. Ah, for that reckless fire man had, When it was witty to be mad. When wild conceits were piled in scores, And lit by flaring metaphors, When all was crazed and out of tune, Yet throbbed with music of the moon. If we could dare to write as ill As some whose voices haunt us still, Even we, perchance, might call our own Their deep enchanting undertone. We are too diffident and nice, Too learned and too overwise, Too much afraid of faults to be The flutes of bold sincerity for as this sweet life passes by we blink and nod with critic eye we've no words rude enough to give its charm so frank and fugitive the green and scarlet of the park the undulating streets at dark the brown smoke blown across the blue this coloured city we walk through the pallid faces full of pain the field smell of the passing wain, the laughter, longing, perfume, strife, the daily spectacle of life. Ah, how shall this be given to rhyme by rhymesters of a knowing time? Ah, for the age when verse was glad, being godlike, to be bad and mad. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Ancient and Modern Muses by Francis Turner Palgrave From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada The Ancient and Modern Muses the monument outlasting bronze was promised well by bards of old the lucid outline of their lay its sweet precision keeps for aye fixed in the ductile language gold 
But we who work with smaller skill And less refined material mould, This close conglomerate English speech, Bequest of many tribes, That each brought here and wrought at from of old. Residium rough eked out by rhyme, Barbarian ornament uncouth, our hope is less to last through art than deeper searching of the heart than broader range of uttered truth one keen-cut group one deed or aim athenian sophocles could show and rest content but shakespeare's stage must hold the glass to every age a thousand forms and passions glow upon the world-wide canvas so with larger scope our art we ply and if the crown be harder won diviner rays around it run with strains of fuller harmony francis turner palgrave end of poem this recording is in the public domain on his sonnets of the wingless hours by eugene lee hamilton from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part two read for librivox.org by lian ya on his sonnets of the wingless hours i wrought them like a targe of hammered gold on which all troy is battling round and round or circe's cup embossed with snakes that wound through buds and myrtles fold on scaly fold or like gold coins which lydian tombs may hold stamped with winged races in the old red ground or twined gold armlets from the funeral mound of some great viking terrible of old i know not in what metal i have wrought nor whether what i fashioned will be thrust beneath the clouds that hide forgotten thought but if it is of gold it will not rust and when the time is ripe it will be brought into the sun and glitter through its dust. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Poet of Today by Sarah Jane Lippincott Grace Greenwood From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6 Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin, the poet of today. More than the soul of ancient song is given to thee, O poet of today. Thy dower comes from a higher than Olympian heaven, in holier beauty and in larger power. To thee, humanity, her woes revealing, would all her griefs and ancient wrongs rehearse, would make thy song the voice of her appealing, and sob her mighty sorrows through thy verse. While in her season of great darkness sharing, hail thou the coming of each promised star, which climbs the midnight of her long despairing, and watch for morning o'er the hills afar. Wherever truth her holy warfare wages, or freedom pines, there let thy voices be heard. Sound like a prophet warning down the ages the human utterances, of God's living word. But bring not thou the battle's stormy chorus, the tramp of armies and the roar of fight, not war's hot smoke to taint the sweet morn o'er us, nor blaze of pillage reddened up the night. O oh, let thy lays prolong that angel singing, girdling with music the Redeemer's star, and breathe God's peace to earth glad tidings bringing from the near heavens of old so dim and far. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Unknown Poets From the Excursion, Book One, by William Wordsworth From the World's Best Poetry, Volume Six Fancy and Sentiment, Part Two Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin Unknown Poets O oh, many are the poets that are sown By nature men endowed with highest gifts, The vision and the faculty divine. 
yet wanting the accomplishment of verse which in the docile seasons of their youth it was denied them to acquire through lack of culture and the inspiring aid of books or haply by a temper too severe or a nice backwardness afraid of shame nor having ere as life advanced been led by circumstance to take unto the height the measure of themselves these favoured beings all but a scattered few live out their time husbanding that which they possess within and go to the grave unthought of strongest minds are often those of whom the noisy world hears least end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Ballad of Prose and Rhyme by Austin Dobson From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia The Ballad of Prose and Rhyme When the ways are heavy with mire and rot In November fogs, in December snows When the north wind howls and the doors are shut There is place and enough for the pains of prose but whenever a scent from the white thorn blows and the jasmine stars at the casement climb and a rosalind face at the lattice shows then hey for the ripple of laughing rhyme when the brain gets dry as an empty nut when the reason stands on its squarest toes when the mind like a beard has a formal cut there is place and enough for the pains of prose but whenever the may blood stirs and glows and the young year draws to the golden prime and sir romeo sticks in his ear a rose then hey for the ripple of laughing rhyme in a theme where the thoughts have a pedant strut in a changing quarrel of eyes and nose in a starched procession of if and but there is place and enough for the pains of prose but whenever a soft glance softer grows and the light hour stands to the trysting time and the secret is told that no one knows then hey for the ripple of laughing rhyme envoy in the workaday world for its needs and woes there is place and enough for the pains of prose but whenever the maybells clash and chime then hey for the ripple of laughing rhyme end of poem this recording is in the public domain on first looking into chapman's homer by john keats from the world's best poetry volume 6 fancy and sentiment part 2 read for librivox.org by jason in canada on first looking into chapman's homer much have i travelled in the realms of gold and many goodly states and kingdoms seen round many western islands i have been which bards in fealty to apollo hold oft of one wide expanse had i been told that deep-browed homer ruled as his demean yet did i never breathe its pure serene till i heard chapman speak out loud and bold then felt i like some watcher of the skies when a new planet swims into his ken or like stout cortez when with eagle eyes he stared at the pacific and all his men looked at each other with a wild surmise silent upon a peak in darien john keats end of poem this recording is in the public domain. The Odyssey Prefacing the Butcher Lang Translation by Andrew Lang From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin The Odyssey as one that for a weary space has lain lulled by the song of circe and her wine in the gardens near the pale of proserpine where the aeon isle forgets the main and only the low lutes of love complain 
and only shadows of one lover's pine as such as one were glad to know the brine salt on his lips and the large air again so gladly from the songs of modern speech men turn and see the stars and feel the free shrill wind beyond the close of heavy flowers and through the music of the languid hours they hear like ocean on a western beach the surge and thunder of the odyssey end of poem this recording is in the public domain Sonnet from Astrophel and Stella by Sir Philip Sidney From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao Sonnet Loving in truth, and fain in verse my love to show That she, dear she, might take some pleasure of my pain Pleasure might cause her read, reading might make her know Knowledge might pity win, and pity grace obtain. I sought fit words to paint the blackest face of woe. Studying inventions fine, her wits to entertain, Oft turning others' leaves, to see if thence would flow Some fresh and fruitful showers upon my sun-burned brain. But words came halting forth, wanting invention's stay. Invention, nature's child, fled septane studies blows and others' feet still seemed but strangers in my way. Thus, great with child to speak, and helpless in my throes, biting my truant pen, beating myself for spite. For, said my muse to me, look in thy heart, and write. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Singer of One Song by Henry Augustine Beers, from The World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2, read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao. The Singer of One Song He sang one song and died, no more but that, a single song and carelessly complete. He would not hind and thresh his chance-grown wheat, nor bring his wild fruit to the common vat, to store the acid rinsings, thin and flat, squeezed from the press or trodden under feet. A few slow beads, blood-red and honey-sweet, oozed from the grape, which burst and spilled its fat. But time, who soonest drops the heaviest things that weight his pack, will carry diamonds long. So through the poet's orchestra, which weaves one music from a thousand stops and strings, pierces the note of that immortal song. High over all, the lonely bugle grieves. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Sonnet by Richard Watson Gilder From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao The Sonnet What is a sonnet? Tis the pearly shell that murmurs of the far-off murmuring sea, A precious jewel carved most curiously. It is a little picture painted well. What is a sonnet? Tis the tear that fell from a great poet's hidden ecstasy. A two-edged sword, a star, a song. Ah, oh, me! Sometimes a heavy tolling funeral bell. This was the flame that shook with Dante's breath. The solemn organ whereon Milton played, And the clear glass where Shakespeare's shadow falls. A sea this is, beware who ventureth, For like a fjord the narrow floor is laid, Mid-ocean deep to the sheer mountain walls. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. An Autograph by James Russell Lowell From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin An Autograph O'er the wet sands that insect crept 
ages a man on earth was known and patient time while nature slept the slender tracing turned to stone twas the first autograph and ours prithee how much of prose or song in league with the creative powers shall scape oblivion's broom so long end of poem this recording is in the public domain art by sir gilbert parker from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part two read for librivox dot org by jason in canada art one art's use what is it but to touch the springs of nature but to hold a torch up for humanity in life's large corridor to guide the feet of peasants and of kings what is it but to carry union through thoughts alien to thoughts kindred and to merge the lines of color that should not diverge and give the sun a window to shine through what is it but to make the world have heed for what its dull eyes else would hardly scan to draw in a stark light a shameless deed and to show the fashion of a kingly man to cherish honor and to smite all shame to lend hearts voices and give thoughts a name two but wherein shall art work shall beauty lead it captive and set kisses on its mouth shall it be strained unto the breast of youth and in a garden live where grows no weed shall it in dalliance with the flaunting world play but soft airs sing but sweet-tempered songs veer lightly from the stress of all great wrongs and lisp of peace mid battle flags unfurled shall it but pluck the sleeve of wantonness and gently chide the folly of our time but wave its golden wand at sin's duress and say ah me ah me to fallow crime nay art serves truth and truth with titan blows strikes fearless at all evil that it knows sir gilbert parker end of poem this recording is in the public domain broken music by thomas bailey aldrich from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part two read for librivox.org by lian yao broken music a note all out of tune in this world's instrument amy levy i know not in what fashion she was made nor what her voice was when she used to speak nor of the silken lashes through a shade on one or rosy cheek i picture her with sorrowful vague eyes illumined with such strange gleams of inner light as linger in the drift of london skies ere twilight turns to night i know not i conjecture twas a girl that with her own most gentle desperate hand from out god's mystic setting plucked life's pearl tis hard to understand so precious life is even to the old the hours are as a miser's coins and she within her hands lay youth's unminted gold and all felicity the winged impetuous spirit the white flame that was her soul once whither has it flown above her brow grey lichens blot her name upon the carven stone this is her book of verses wren like notes shy franknesses blind gropings haunting fears at times across the chords abruptly floats a mist of passionate tears a fragile lyre too tensely keyed and strung a broken music weirdly incomplete here a proud mind self-baffled and self-stung lies coiled in dark defeat end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Modern Poet, A Song of Derivations, by Alice Maynow, from The World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, 
Fancy and Sentiment, Part Two. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. The Modern Poet, A Song of Derivations. I come from nothing, but from where come the undying thoughts I bear? Down through long links of death and birth from the past poets of the earth, my immortality is there. I am like the blossom of an hour, but long, long vanished sun and shower awoke my breath i' the young world's air. I track the past back everywhere, through seed and flower, and seed and flower. Or I am like a stream that flows full of the cold springs that arose in morning lands, in distant hills and down the plain my channel fills with melting of forgotten snows. Voices I have not heard possessed my own fresh songs. My thoughts are blessed with relics of the far unknown, and mixed with memories not my own, the sweet streams throng into my breast. Before this life began to be, the happy songs that waken me woke long ago, and far apart, heavily on this little heart, presses this immortality. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Jester's Plea by Frederick Locker Lampson From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada The Jester's Plea Published in a volume by several authors for the benefit of the starving weavers of Lancashire during the American Civil War. The world! Was Jester ever in a viler than the present? Yet if it ugly be, as sin it almost is, as pleasant. It is a merry world, pro tem and some are gay, and therefore it pleases them, but some condemn the fun they do not care for. It is an ugly world. Offend good people, how they wrangle, the manners that they never mend, the characters they mangle. They eat and drink and scheme and plot and go to church on Sunday, and many are afraid of God, and more of Mrs. Grundy. The time for pen and sword was when my lady fair, for pity, could tend her wounded knight, and then grow tender at his ditty. Some ladies now make pretty songs, and some make pretty nurses. Some men are good for writing wrongs, and some for writing verses. I wish we better understood the tax that poets levy. I know the muse is very good. I think she's rather heavy. Now she compounds for winning ways by morals of the sternest. Methinks the lays of nowadays are painfully in earnest. When wisdom halts, I humbly try to make the most of folly. If Pallas be unwilling, I prefer to flirt with Polly. To quit the goddess for the maid seems low in lofty musers. But Pallas is a haughty jade and beggars can't be choosers. I do not wish to see the slaves of party stirring passion, or psalms quite superseding staves, or piety the fashion. I bless the hearts where pity glows, who, here together banded, are holding out a hand to those that wait so empty-handed. A righteous work, my masters may a jester by confession scarce noticed join half sad half gay the close of your procession the motley here seems out of place with graver robes to mingle but if one tear bedews his face forgive the bells their jingle frederick locker lampson end of poem this recording is in the public domain Verses Why Burnt by Walter Savage Landor From The World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, 
Part Two. Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao. Verses Why Burnt. How many verses have I thrown into the fire? Because the one peculiar word, the wanted most, was irrecoverably lost. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sweet Nature's Voice from Susan, a poem of degrees by Arthur Joseph Munby, from the World's Best Poetry, Volume Six, Fancy and Sentiment, Part Two, read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Sweet Nature's Voice from Susan, a poem of degrees. Her master gave the signal with a look, then timidly, as if afraid, she took in her rough hands the laureate's dainty book and straight began but when she did begin her own mute sense of poesy within broke forth to hail the poet and to greet his graceful fancies and the accents sweet in which they are expressed o oh, lately lost long loved long honoured and whose captain's post no living bard is competent to fill how strange to the deep heart that now is still and to the vanished hand and to the ear whose soft melodious measures are so dear to us who cannot rival them how strange if thou the lord of such a various range hadst heard this new voice telling arden's tale for this was no prim maiden scant and pale full of weak sentiment and thin delight in pretty rhymes who mars the resonant might of noble verse with arts rhetorical and simulated frenzy not at all this was a peasant woman large and strong red-handed ignorant unused to song accustomed rather to the rudest prose and yet there lived within her rustic clothes a heart as true as arden's and a brain keener than his that counts it false and vain to seem aught else than simply what she is how singular her faculty of bliss bliss in her servile work bliss deep and full in things beyond the vision of the dull whatever their rank things beautiful as these sonorous lines and solemn harmonies suiting the tale they tell of bliss in love ah chiefly that which lifts her soul above its common life and gives to labour's course such fervour of imaginative force as makes a passion of her basest toil surely this servant dress was but a foil to her more lofty being as she read her accent was as pure and all she said as full of interest and of varied grace as were the changeful moods that over her face passed like swift clouds across a windy sky at each sad stage of enoch's history such ease such pathos such abandonment to what she uttered moulded as she went her soft sweet voice and with such self-control did she interpreting the poet's soul bridle her own that when the tale was done i looked at her amazed she seemed like one who from some sphere of music had come down and donned the white cap and the cotton gown as if to show how much of skill and art may dwell unthought of in the humblest heart yet there was no great mystery to tell she felt it deeply so she read it well end of poem this recording is in the public domain genius by richard henry hengist horn from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part two Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin. Genius. 
far out at sea the sun was high while veered the wind and flapped the sail we saw a snow-white butterfly dancing before the fitful gale far out at sea the little wanderer who had lost his way of danger nothing knew settled a while upon the mast then fluttered o'er the waters blue far out at sea above there gleamed the boundless sky beneath the boundless ocean sheen between them danced the butterfly the spirit life of this vast scene far out at sea the tiny soul then soared away seeking the clouds on fragile wings lured by the brighter purer ray which hope's ecstatic morning brings far out at sea away he sped with shimmering glee scarce seen now lost yet onward borne night comes with wind and rain and he no more will dance before the morn far out at sea he dies unlike his mates i ween perhaps not sooner or worse crossed and he hath felt thought known and seen a larger life and hope though lost far out at sea end of poem this recording is in the public domain One Day I Wrote Her Name by Edmund Spencer From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6 Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter as the narrator And Sonia as the woman One Day I Wrote Her Name From Amoretti, Sonnet 75 One day I wrote her name upon the strand But came the waves and washed it away. Again I wrote it with a second hand, But came the tide, And made my pains his prey. Vain man, said she, That dost in vain essay A mortal thing so to immortalize, For I myself shall like to this decay, And eke my name be wiped out likewise. Not so, Quod I, let baser things devise to die in dust, for thou shalt live by fame. My verse your virtues rare shall eternize, and in the heavens write your glorious name, where, when as death shall all the world subdue, our love shall live and later life renew. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Poet's Death, from The Lay of the Last Minstrel, Canto V, by Sir Walter Scott, from The World's Best Poetry, Volume Six, Fancy and Sentiment, Part Two, read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada. The Poet's Death Call it not vain, they do not err who say that when the poet dies, mute nature mourns her worshipper, and celebrates his obsequies who say tall cliff and cavern lone for the departed bard make moan that mountains weep in crystal rill that flowers in tears of balm distill through his loved groves that breezes sigh and oaks in deeper groan reply and rivers teach their rushing wave to murmur dirges round his grave not that in sooth or mortal urn those things inanimate can mourn but that the stream the wood the gale is vocal with the plaintive wail of those who else forgotten long lived in the poet's faithful song and with the poet's parting breath whose memory feels a second death the maid's pale shade who wails her lot that love true love should be forgot from rose and hawthorn shakes the tear upon the gentle minstrel's bier the phantom knight his glory fled mourns o'er the field he heaped with dead mounts the wild blast that sweeps amain and shrieks along the battle plain the chief whose antique crownlet long still sparkled in the feudal song now from the mountain's misty throne sees 
in the thanadom once his own his ashes undistinguished lie his place his power his memory die his groans the lonely caverns fill his tears of rage impel the rill all mourn the minstrel's harp unstrung their name unknown their praise unsung sir walter scott end of poem this recording is in the public domain thy songs and mine by julia c r dor from the world's best poetry volume 6 fancy and sentiment part 2 read for librivox.org by thomas peter thy songs and mine sing thou my songs for me when i am dead soul of my soul some day thou wilt awake to see the morning on the hilltops break and the far summits flame with rosy red but i shall wake not though above my head armies should thunder nor for love's sweet sake though he the tenderest pilgrimage should make where i am lying in my grassy bed i shall be silent with my song half sung i shall be dumb with half the story told I shall be mute, leaving the half unsaid. Take thou the harp, ere it be yet unstrung. Wake thou the lyre, ere yet its chords be cold. Sing thou my songs, and thine, when I am dead. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Sharing of the Earth by J. C. Friedrich von Schiller Translated from the German by Lord Bulver Lytton From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia as the narrator Craig Franklin as the God Jason in Canada as the Monarch And Lian Yao as the Poet The Sharing of the Earth take the world cried the god from his heaven to man i proclaim you its heirs to divide it amongst you tis given you have only to settle the shares each takes for himself as it pleases old and young have alike their desire the harvest the husbandman seizes through the wood and the chase sweeps the squire the merchant his warehouse is locking the abbot is choosing his wine cries the monarch the thoroughfare blocking every toll for the passage is mine all too late when the sharing was over comes the poet he came from afar nothing left can the laggard discover not an inch but its owners there are woe is me is there nothing remaining for the son who best loves thee alone Thus to Jove went his voice in complaining, as he fell at the thunderer's throne. In the land of thy dreams, if abiding, quoth the god, canst thou murmur at me? Where wert thou when the earth was dividing? I was, said the poet, by thee. Mine eye by thy glory was captured, mine ear by thy music of bliss pardon him whom thy world so enraptured as to lose him his portion in this alas said the god earth is given field forest and market and all what say you to quarters in heaven will admit you whenever you call end of poem this recording is in the public domain The Immortality of Genius by Sextus Propertius Translated from Latin by Dr. James Cranston From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia The Immortality of Genius Orpheus, tis said, the Thracian lyre-strings sweeping, stayed the swift stream, 
and soothed the savage brute cytheron's rocks to thebes spontaneous leaping rose into walls before amphion's lute with dripping steeds did galatia follow neath etna's crags lone polyphemus song is it strange the loved of bacchus and apollo leads captive with his lay the maiden throng though no tenarian blocks uphold my dwelling nor ivory panels shine tween gilded beams no orchards mine phaeacia's woods excelling no chiselled grots where marcian water streams yet song is mine my strain the heart engages faint from the dance sings the lithe muse with me o happy maid whose name adorns my pages each lay a lasting monument to thee the pyramids that cleave heaven's jewelled portal elian jove's star-spangled dome the tomb where rich mausolus sleeps are not immortal nor shall escape inevitable doom devouring fire and rains will mar their splendor the weight of years will drag the marble down genius alone a name can deathless render and round the forehead wreathe the unfading crown end of poem this recording is in the public domain Written on a flyleaf of Theocritus by Morris Thompson. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2. Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin. Written on a flyleaf of Theocritus. Those were good times in olden days, of which the poet has his dreams, when gods beset the woodland ways and lay in wait by all the streams. One could be sure of something then, severely simple, simply grand, or keenly, subtly sweet as when Venus and love went hand in hand. Now I would give, such is my need, all the world's store of rhythm and rhyme to see Pan fluting on a reed, and with his goat hoof keeping time. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Books from the Calendar of Shepherdess, 1528, by Anonymous. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Books from the Calendar of Shepherdess, 1528. He that many bookes read is, cunning shall he be. Wisdom is soon a court in many lavers it is sought but sloth that no book abort for reason taketh no thought his thrifte cometh behind it. end of poem this recording is in the public domain the scholar from edwin the fair by sir henry tyler from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part two read for librivox dot org by jason in canada the scholar from edwin the fair this life and all that it contains to him is but a tissue of illuminous dreams filled with book wisdom pictured thought and love that on its own creations spends itself all things he understands and nothing does profusely eloquent in copious praise of action he will talk to you as one whose wisdom lay in dealings and transactions yet so much action as might tie his shoe cannot his will command himself alone by his own wisdom not a jot the gainer of silence and the hundred thousand things tis better not to mention he will speak and still most wisely sir henry taylor end of poem this recording is in the public domain the bookstore 
by Clinton Scollard. From The World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2. Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao. The Bookstore. It stands in a winding street, a quiet and restful nook, apart from the endless beat of the noisy heart of trade. There's never a spot more cool of a hot midsummer day, by the brink of a forest pool, or the bank of a crystal brook, in the maple's breezy shade, than the bookstore, old and grey. Here are precious gems of thought that were quarried long ago, some in vellum bound and wrought with letters and lines of gold. Here are curious rows of calf, and perchance in earls of air. Here are countless mows of chaff and parchment folio, like leaves that are cracked with cold, all puckered and brown and sere. In every age and clime, Live the monarchs of the brain, and the lords of prose and rhyme. Years after the long last sleep has come to the kings of earth, and their names have passed away, roar on through death and birth. And the thrones of their domain are found where the shades are deep, in the bookstore, old and grey. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Books by John Higgins From The World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao Books For why, who writes such histories as these, Doth often bring the reader's heart such ease? As when they sit and see what he doth note, Well fare his heart, say they, this book that wrote. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Influence of Music From King Henry VIII, Act Three, Scene One, by Shakespeare From The World's Best Poetry, Volume Six, Fancy and Sentiment, Part Two Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao Influence of Music Orpheus with his lute made trees, and the mountain tops that freeze, bow themselves when he did sing. To his music plants and flowers, ever sprung as sun and showers, there had made a lasting spring. Everything that heard him play, even the billows of the sea, hung their heads and then lay by. In sweet music is such art, killing care and grief of heart, fall asleep, or hearing, die. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Music from The Merchant of Venice, Act 5, Scene 1, by William Shakespeare. From The World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia as the narrator. Jason in Canada as Lorenzo. And Lian Yao as Jessica. Music from the Merchant of Venice, Act Five, Scene One. How sweet the moonlight sleeps upon this bank! Here will we sit and let the sounds of music creep in our ears. Soft stillness and the night become the touches of sweet harmony. Sit, Jessica, look. How the floor of heaven is thick inlaid with patines of bright gold. There's not the smallest orb which thou behold'st, But in his motion like an angel sings, Still choiring to the young-eyed cherubins. Such harmony is in immortal souls, But whilst this muddy vesture of decay Doth grossly close it in, we cannot hear it. I am never merry when I hear sweet music. The reason is your spirits are attentive. Therefore the poet did feign that Orpheus drew lives, stones, and floods, since not so stockish, hard, and full of rage, but music for the time doth change his nature. That man that hath no music in himself, nor is not moved with concord of sweet sounds, is fit for treasons, stratagems, and spoils. The motions of his spirit are dull as night, and his affections dark as Erebus. 
let no such man be trusted. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Two by Percy Bysshe Shelley. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume Six. Fancy and Sentiment, Part Two. Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao. Two. Music, when soft voices die, vibrates in the memory. Odors, when sweet violets sicken, live within the sense they quicken. Rose leaves, when the rose is dead, are heaped for the beloved's bed. And so thy thoughts, when thou art gone, love itself shall slumber on. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Cello by Richard Watson Gilder From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin as the narrator And Lian Yao as the cello The Cello When late I heard the trembling cello play In every face I read sad memories That from dark secret chambers where they lay rose and looked forth from melancholy eyes so every mournful thought found there a tone to match despondence sorrow knew its mate ill fortune sighed and mute despair made moan and one deep chord gave answer late too late then ceased the quivering strain and swift returned into its depths the secret of each heart each face took on its mask where lately burned a spirit charmed to sight by music's art but unto one who caught that inner flame no face of all can ever seem the same end of poem this recording is in the public domain a song for saint cecilia's day 1687 by John Dryden, from the World's Best Poetry, Volume Six, Fancy and Sentiment, Part Two, read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. A Song for Saint Cecilia's Day, 1687. From harmony, from heavenly harmony, this universal frame began, when nature underneath a heap of jarring atoms lay, and could not heave her head. The tuneful voice was heard from high. Arise, ye more than dead. Then cold and hot and moist and dry, In order to their stations leap, And music's power obey. From harmony, from heavenly harmony, This universal frame began. From harmony to harmony, Through all the compass of the notes it ran. The diapason closing full in man. What passion cannot music raise and quell? When Jubal struck the corded shell, His listening brethren stood around, And wondering on their faces fell To worship that celestial sound. Less than a god they thought there could not dwell Within the hollow of that shell That spoke so sweetly and so well. What passion cannot music raise and quell? The trumpet's loud clangor excites us to arms With shrill notes of anger and mortal alarms. The double, double, double beat of the thundering drum Cries, hark, the foes come, charge, charge, Tis too late to retreat. The soft complaining flute in dying notes discovers The woes of hopeless lovers Whose dirge is whispered by the warbling lute. Sharp violins proclaim their jealous pangs And desperation, fury, frantic indignation, Depth of pains and height of passion For the fair, disdainful dame. But, oh! What art can teach, 
What human voice can reach the sacred organ's praise? Notes inspiring holy love, Notes that wing their heavenly ways To mend the choirs above. Orpheus could lead the savage race, And trees uprooted left their place, Sequacious of the lyre. But bright Cecilia raised the wonder higher, When to her organ vocal breath was given, An angel heard, and straight appeared, Mistaking earth for heaven. Grand Chorus As from the power of sacred lays The spheres began to move, And sung the great Creator's praise To all the blessed above. So when the last and dreadful hour This crumbling pageant shall devour, The trumpet shall be heard on high, The dead shall live, the living die, And music shall untune the sky. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Spell by Paul Verlaine Translated from the French by Gertrude Hall From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6 Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter The Spell Son joyeux important d'un clavecin sonneur Petrus Borel The Keyboard Over which two slim hands float Shines vaguely in the twilight, pink and gray, Whilst with a sound like wings, Note after note takes flight, To form a pensive little lay that strays, Discreet and charming, faint, remote, About the room where perfumes of her stray. What is this sudden quiet cradling me, To that dim ditty's dreamy rise and fall? What do you want with me, pale melody? What is it that you want, ghost musical, That fades toward the window waveringly, A little open on the garden small? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Passions by William Collins From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6 Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2, read for LibriVox.org, by Sonia. The Passions, an Ode for Music When music, heavenly maid, was young, While yet in early Greece she sung, The passions oft, to hear her shell, Thronged around her magic cell. Exulting, trembling, raging, fainting, Possessed beyond the muse's painting, by turns they felt the glowing mind, Disturbed, delighted, raised, refined. Till once, tis said, when all were fired, Filled with fury, rapt, inspired, From the supporting myrtles round, They snatched her instruments of sound. And as they oft had heard apart Sweet lessons of her forceful art, Each, for madness ruled the hour, would prove his own expressive power. First fear his hand, its skill to try, Amid the chords bewildered laid, And back recoiled, he knew not why, Even at the sound himself had made. Next anger rushed, his eyes on fire, In lightnings owned his secret stings, In one rude clash he struck the lyre, and swept with hurried hand the strings. With woeful measures, wan despair, Lo, sullen sounds his grief beguiled, A solemn, strange and mingled air, T'was sad by fits, by starts t'was wild. But thou, O hope, with eyes so fair, What was thy delightful measure? Still it whispered promised pleasure, and bade the lovely scenes at distance hail. Still would her touch the strain prolong, And from the rocks, the woods, the vale, She called on echo still, through all the song, 
and where her sweetest theme she chose a soft responsive voice was heard at every close and hope enchanted smiled and waved her golden hair and longer had she sung but with a frown revenge impatient rose he threw his blood-stained sword in thunder down and with a withering look the war denouncing trumpet took and blew a blast so loud and dread where never prophetic sounds so full of woe and ever and anon he beat the doubling drum with furious heat and though sometimes each dreary pause between dejected pity at his side her soul subduing voice applied yet still he kept his wild unaltered mien while each strained ball of sight seemed bursting from his head thy numbers jealousy to naught were fixed sad proof of thy distressful state of differing themes the veering song was mixed and now it courted love now raving called on hate with eyes upraised as one inspired pale melancholy sate retired and from her wild sequestered seat in notes by distance made more sweet poured through the mellow horn her pensive soul and dashing soft from rocks around bubbling runnels joined the sound through glades and glooms the mingled measure stole or over some haunted stream with fond delay round an holy calm diffusing love of peace and lonely musing in hollow murmurs died away but oh how altered was its sprightlier tone when cheerfulness a nymph of healthiest hue her bow across her shoulder flung her buskins gemmed with morning dew blew an inspiring air that dale and thicket rung the hunter's call to fawn and dryad known the oak-crowned sisters and their chaste-eyed queen satyrs and sylvan boys were seen peeping from forth their alleys green brown exercise rejoiced to hear and sport leapt up and seized his speech and spear last came joy's ecstatic trial he with viny crown advancing first to the lively pipe his hand addressed but soon he saw the brisk awakening vile whose sweet entrancing voice he loved the best they would have thought who heard the strain they saw in tempest vale her native maids amidst the festal sounding shades to some unwearied minstrel dancing while as his flying fingers kissed the strings love framed with mirth a gay fantastic round loose were her tresses seen her zone unbound and he amidst his frolic play as if he would the charming air repay shook thousand odors from his dewy wings o oh, music sphere descended maid friend of pleasure wisdom's aid why goddess why to us denied layst thou thy ancient lyre aside as in that loved athenian bower you learned an all commanding power thy mimic soul o oh, nymph endeared can well recall what then it heard where is thy native simple heart devote to virtue fancy art arise as in that elder time warm energetic chaste sublime thy wonders in that godlike age fill thy recording sister's page tis said and i believe the tale thy humblest reed could more prevail had more of strength diviner rage than all which charms this laggard age even all at once together found cecilia's mingled world of sound oh bid our vain endeavours cease revive the just designs of greece return in all thy simple state confirm the tales her sons relate end of poem this recording is in the public domain Invocation from the Davideus by Abraham Cowley From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 
Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin. Invocation Awake, awake, my Lear, and tell thy silent master's humble tale, in sounds that may prevail, sounds that gentle thoughts inspire, though so exalted she and I so lowly be, tell her such different notes make all thy harmony. Hark, how the strings awake, and though the moving hand approach not near, themselves with awful fear a kind of numerous trembling make. Now all thy forces try, now all thy charms apply, revenge upon her ear the conquest of her eye. Weaklier, thy virtue sure is useless here, since thou art only found to cure, but not to wound. And she to wound, but not to cure, too weak, too, wilt thou prove, my passion to remove. Physic to other ills, thou art nourishment to love. Sleep, sleep again, my Leah, for thou canst never tell my humble tale, in sounds that will prevail, nor gentle thoughts in her inspire. All thy vain mirth lay by, bid thy strings silent lie. Sleep, sleep again, my Leah, and let thy master die. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Alexander's Feast, or The Power of Music, by John Dryden. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter as the narrator. And Jason in Canada as the chorus. Alexander's Feast, or The Power of Music, an ode. It was at the royal feast for Persia won by Philip's warlike son. Aloft in awful state, the godlike hero sate on his imperial throne. His valiant peers were placed around, their brows with roses and with myrtles bound, so should desert and arms be crowned. The lovely Thais by his side sate like a blooming eastern bride. In flower of youth, and beauty's pride. Happy, happy, happy pair, none but the brave, none but the brave, none but the brave deserves the fair. Happy, happy, happy pair, none but the brave, none but the brave, none but the brave deserves the fair. Timotheus, placed on high amid the tuneful choir, with flying fingers touched the lyre. The trembling notes ascend the sky, and heavenly joys inspire. The song began from Jove, who left his blissful seats above. Such is the power of mighty love. A dragon's fiery form belied the god. Sublime on radiant spires he rode, when he to fair Olympia pressed. And while he sought her snowy breast, then round her slender waist he curled, And stamped an image of himself, A sovereign of the world. The listening crowd admire the lofty sound, A present deity, they shout around, A present deity, the vaulted roofs rebound. With ravished ears the monarch hears, Assumes the god, affects to nod, And seems to shake the spheres. With ravished ears the monarch hears, Assumes the god, affects to nod, And seems to shake the spheres. The praise of Bacchus then the sweet musician sung, Of Bacchus, ever fair and ever young. The jolly god in triumph comes, Sound the trumpets, beat the drums. Flushed with a purple grace, He shows his honest face. Now give the hot boy's breath. He comes, he comes. Bacchus, ever fair and young, Drinking joys did first ordain. Bacchus' blessings are a treasure. Drinking is the soldier's pleasure. Rich the treasure, sweet the pleasure. Sweet is pleasure after pain. 
Bacchus' blessings are a treasure. Drinking is the soldier's pleasure. Rich the treasure, sweet the pleasure. Sweet is pleasure after pain. Soothed with the sound the king grew vain, Fought all his battles over again, And thrice he routed all his foes, And thrice he slew the slain. The master saw the madness rise, His glowing cheeks, his ardent eyes, And, while he heaven and earth defied, Changed his hand and checked his pride. He chose a mournful muse, Soft pity to infuse, he sung Darius, great and good, by too severe a fate. Fallen, 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 fallen from his high estate, and weltering in his blood. Deserted, at his utmost need, by those his former bounty fed. On the bare earth exposed he lies, with not a friend to close his eyes. With downcast looks the joyless victor sate, Revolving in his altered soul The various turns of chance below, And, now and then, a sigh he stole, And tears began to flow. Revolving in his altered soul The various turns of chance below, And, now and then, a sigh he stole, And tears began to flow. The mighty master smiled, to see that love was in the next degree. T'was but a kindred sound to move, For pity melts the mind to love. Softly sweet, in Lydian measures, Soon he soothed his soul to pleasures. War, he sung, is toil and trouble, Honour but an empty bubble, Never ending, still beginning, Fighting still, and still destroying. If the world be worth thy winning, Think, oh, think it worth enjoying. Lovely Thais sits beside thee, Take the good the gods provide thee. The many rend the skies with loud applause, So love was crowned, but music won the cause. The prince, unable to conceal his pain, Gazed on the fair who caused his care, And sighed and looked sighed and looked sighed and looked and sighed again at length with love and wine at once oppressed the vanquished victor sunk upon her breast the prince unable to conceal his pain gazed on the fair who caused his care and sighed and looked sighed and looked sighed and looked and sighed again at length, with love and wine at once oppressed, The vanquished victor sunk upon her breast. Now strike the golden lyre again, A louder yet, and yet a louder strain. Break his bands of sleep asunder, And rouse him like a rattling peal of thunder. Hark, hark, the horrid sound has raised up his head, As awaked from the dead and amazed. He stares around. Revenge, revenge, Timotheus cries. See the furies arise. See the snakes that they rear, how they hiss in their hair, and the sparkles that flash from their eyes. Behold a ghastly band, each a torch in his hand. Those are Grecian ghosts that in battle were slain, and unburied remain, inglorious on the plain. Give the vengeance due to the valiant crew. Behold how they toss their torches on high, How they point to the Persian abodes And glittering temples of their hostile gods. The princes applaud with a furious joy, And the king seized a flambeau with zeal to destroy. Thais led the way to light him to his prey, And, like another Helen, fired another Troy. And the king seized a flambeau with zeal to destroy. Thais led the way to light him to his prey, And, like another Helen, fired another Troy. Thus long ago, ere heaving bellows learned to blow, 
while organs yet were mute timotheus to his breathing flute and sounding lyre could swell the soul to rage or kindle soft desire at last divine cecilia came inventress of the vocal frame the sweet enthusiast from her sacred store enlarged the former narrow bounds and added length to solemn sounds with nature's mother wit and arts unknown before let old timotheus yield the prize or both divide the crown he raised a mortal to the skies she drew an angel down at last divine cecilia came inventress of the vocal frame the sweet enthusiast from her sacred store enlarged the former narrow bounds and added length to solemn sounds with nature's mother wit and arts unknown before let old timotheus yield the prize or both divide the crown he raised a mortal to the skies she drew an angel down end of poem this recording is in the public domain. Beethoven's Third Symphony by Richard Hovey From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6 Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada Beethoven's Third Symphony passion and pain the outcry of despair the pang of the unattainable desire and youth's delight in pleasures that expire and sweet high dreamings of the good and fair clashing in swift soul storm through which no prayer uplifted stays the destined death stroke dire then through a mighty sorrowing as through fire the soul burnt pure yearns forth into the air of the dear earth and with the scent of flowers and song of birds assuaged takes heart again made cheerier with this drinking of god's wine and turns with healing to the world of men and high above a sweet strong angel towers and love makes life triumphant and divine Richard Hovey. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Pan in Wall Street by Edmund Clarence Stedman. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6. Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. Pan in Wall Street. Just where the Treasury's marble front Looks over Wall Street's mingled nations, Where Jews and Gentiles most are wont To throng for trade and last quotations, Where hour by hour the rates of gold outrival In the ears of people the quarter chimes, Serenely told from Trinity's undaunted steeple. Even there I heard a strange, wild strain Sound high above the modern clamour, above the cries of greed and gain the curbstone war the auction's hammer and swift on music's misty ways it led from all this strife for millions to ancient sweet do-nothing days among the curdle-robed sicilians and as it stilled the multitude and yet more joyous rose and shriller i saw the minstrel where he stood at ease against a Doric pillar. One hand a droning organ played, the other held a pan's pipe, fashioned like those of old, to lips that made the reeds give out that strain impassioned. T'was Pan himself had wandered here, a strolling through this sordid city, and piping to the civic ear the prelude of some pastoral ditty. The demigod had crossed the seas, from haunts of shepherd, nymph, and satyr, and Syracusan times, to these far shores and twenty centuries later. A ragged cap was on his head, but, hidden thus, there was no doubting that, all with crispy locks o'erspread, his gnarled horns were somewhere sprouting. 
his club feet, cased in rusty shoes, were crossed, as on some frieze you see them, and trousers, patched of diverse hues, concealed his crooked shanks beneath them. He filled the quivering reeds with sound, and o'er his mouth their changes shifted, and with his goat's eyes looked around, where'er the passing current drifted. And soon, as on Trinacrian hills, the nymphs and herdsmen ran to hear him, even now the tradesmen from their tills, with clerks and porters, crowded near him. The bulls and bears together drew, from Johnsey Court and New Street Alley, as erst, if pastorals be true, came beasts from every wooded valley. The random passers stayed to list, a boxer Egon, rough and merry, a Broadway Daphnis, on his tryst with neighs at the Brooklyn Ferry. A one-eyed Cyclops halted long in tattered cloak of army pattern, and Galatia joined the throng, a blousy, apple-vending slattern, while old Salinas staggered out from some new-fangled lunch-house handy, and bade the piper, with a shout, to strike up Yankee Doodle Dandy. A newsboy and a peanut girl, like little fawns, began to caper. His hair was all in tangled curl, her tawny legs were bare and taper, and still the gathering larger grew, and gave its pence and crowded nigher, while I the shepherd minstrel blew his pipe and struck the gamut higher. O heart of nature, beating still with throbs her vernal passion taught her, even here is on the vine-clad hill or by the air thews in water. New forms may fold the speech, new lands arise within these ocean portals, but music waves eternal wands, enchantress of the souls of mortals. So thought I, but among us trod a man in blue, with the legal baton, and scoffed the vagrant demigod, and pushed him from the step I sat on. Doubting, I mused upon the cry, Great Pan is dead. And all the people went on their ways, and clear and high the quarter sounded from the steeple. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. On an Intaglio Head of Minerva by Thomas Bailey Aldrich From The World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada On an Intaglio Head of Minerva Beneath the warrior's helm, behold the flowing tresses of the woman. Minerva, Pallas, what you will, a winsome creature, Greek or Roman. Minerva? No, tis some sly minx in cousin's helmet masquerading. If not, then wisdom was a dame for sonnets and for serenading. I thought the goddess cold, austere not made for love's despairs and blisses. Did Pallas wear her hair like that? Was wisdom's mouth so shaped for kisses? The nightingale should be her bird, and not the owl, big-eyed and solemn. How very fresh she looks, and yet she's older far than Trajan's column. The magic hand that carved this face and set this vine-work round it running Perhaps ere mighty Phidias wrought had lost its subtle skill and cunning. Who was he? Was he glad or sad, who knew to carve in such a fashion? Perchance he graved the dainty head for some brown girl that scorned his passion. Perchance in some still garden place, where neither fount nor tree to-day is, he flung the jewel at the feet of Phryn, or perhaps twas Laius. But he is dust, we may not know his happy or unhappy story. Nameless and dead these centuries, his work outlives him, there's his glory. Both man and jewel lay in earth beneath a lava-buried city. The countless summers came and went, with neither haste nor hate, 
nor pity. Years blotted out the man, but left the jewel fresh as any blossom, till some Visconti dug it up to rise and fall on Mabel's bosom. O oh, nameless brother, see how time your gracious handiwork has guarded, see how your loving, patient art has come at last to be rewarded. Who would not suffer slights of men and pangs of hopeless passion also? To have his carven agate stone on such a bosom rise and fall so. Thomas Bailey Aldrich. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Artist by Arthur Grissom From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org By Sonia as the narrator And Lian Yao as the master The Artist He wrought with patience long and weary years Upon his masterpiece, entitled Fate And dreamed sweet dreams, the while his crust he ate and gave his work his soul, his strength, and tears. His task, complete at last, he had no fears the world would not pronounce his genius great. But poor, unknown, pray, what could he create? The mad world laughed and gave not praise but jeers. Impelled to ask wherein his work was wrong, he sought, despairing, one whose art was dead, but on whose brow were wreathed the bays of fame. The master gazed upon the picture long. It lacks one thing to make it great, he said, and signed the canvas with his own great name. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Painted Fan by Louise Chandler Moulton From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia A Painted Fan Roses and butterflies snared on a fan All that is left of summer gone by Of swift bright wings that flashed in the sun And loveliest blossoms that bloomed to die by what subtle spell did you lure them here, Fixing a beauty that will not change? Roses whose petals never will fall, Bright swift wings that never will range. Had you owned but the skill to snare as well The swift-winged hours that came and went, To prison the words that in music died, And fixed with a spell the heart's content? Then had you been of magicians the chief, And loved and lovers should bless your art, If you could but have painted the soul of the thing, Not the rose alone, but the rose's heart. Flown are those days with their winged delights, As the odour is gone from the summer rose. Yet still, whenever I wave my fan, The soft south wind of memory blows. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. On a Fan That Belonged to the Marquise de Pompadour Ballade by Austin Dobson From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6 Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter On a Fan That Belonged to the Marquise de Pompadour Ballade Chicken skin, delicate, white, painted by Carlo Venlu. Loves in a riot of light, roses and vaporous blue. Hark to the dainty frou frou. Picture above, if you can, eyes that could melt as the dew. This was the Pompadour's fan. See how they rise at the sight, thronging the oeil de boeuf through. Courtiers as butterflies bright, Beauties that Fragonard drew, Talon rouge, Falaba, 
Q, Cardinal Duke, to a man, eager to sigh or to sue. This was the Pompadour's fan. Ah, but things more than polite hung on this toy, voyez-vous, matters of state and of might, things that great ministers do, things that, maybe, overthrew those in whose brains they began. Here was the sign and the cue. This was the Pompadour's fan. Envoy where are the secrets that knew weavings of plot and of plan but where is the pompadour too this was the pompadour's fan end of poem this recording is in the public domain heck and you by bliss carmen from the world's best poetry volume six Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org By Sonia as the narrator Craig Franklin as God Thomas Peter as Hack Lian Yao as Hugh And Jason in Canada as the Master Workman Hack and You Hack and You were the sons of God In the earlier earth than now One at his right hand, one at his left to obey as he taught them how and heck was blind and hugh was dumb but both had the wild wild heart and god's calm will was their burning will and the gist of their toil was art they made the moon and the belted stars they set the sun to ride they loosed the girdle and veil of the sea the wind and the purple tide both flower and beast beneath their hands to beauty and speed outgrew the furious fumbling hand of heck and the glorying hand of hugh then fire and clay they fashioned a man and painted him rosy brown and god himself blew hard in his eyes let them burn till they smoulder down and there said heck and da thought you we'll rest for our toil is done but nay the master workman said for your toil is just begun and ye who served me of old as god shall serve me anew as man till i compass the dream that is in my heart and perfect the vaster plan and still the craftsman over his craft in the vague white light of dawn with god's calm will for his burning will while the mounting day comes on yearning wind swift indolent wild toils with those shadowy two the faltering restless hand of heck and the tireless hand of hugh end of poem this recording is in the public domain. The Axe by Isabella Valancy Crawford From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin as the narrator Thomas Peter as Max And Sonia as The Axe The Axe from Malcolm's Katie High grew the snow beneath the low-hung sky, And all was silent in the wilderness. In trance of stillness nature heard her god, Rebuilding her spent fires and veiled her face, While the great worker brooded o'er his work. Bite deep and wide, O Ax, the tree, What doth thy bold voice promise me? I promise thee all joyous things That furnish forth the lives of kings for every silver ringing blow cities and palaces shall grow bite deep and wide o oh axe the tree tell wider prophecies to me when rust hath gnawed me deep and red a nation strong shall lift his head his crown the very heavens shall smite eons 
shall build him in his might. Bite deep and wide, O axe, the tree. Bright seer, help on thy prophecy. Max smote the snow way tree and lightly laughed. See, friend, he cried to one that looked and smiled. My axe and I, we do immortal tasks. We build up nations, this my axe and I. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Labor by Francis Sargent Osgood from the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2. Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada as the narrator, Lian Yao as the robin, and Craig Franklin as the wild bee. Labor. Pause not to dream of the future before us. Pause not to weep the wild cares that come o'er us. Hark, how creation's deep musical chorus, unintermitting, goes up into heaven. Never the ocean wave falters in flowing. Never the little seed stops in its growing. More and more richly the rose heart keeps glowing, till from its nourishing stem it is riven. Labour is worship. The robin is singing. Labour is worship. The wild bee is ringing. Listen, that eloquent whisper upspringing speaks to thy soul from out nature's great heart. From the dark cloud flows the life-giving shower. From the rough sod blows the soft breathing flower. From the small insect, the rich coral bower, only man in the plan shrinks from his part. Labor is life, tis the still water faileth, idleness ever despaireth, bewaileth, keep the watch wound, for the dark rust assaileth, flowers droop and die in the stillness of noon. Labor is glory, the flying cloud lightens, only the waving wing changes and brightens, idle hearts only the dark future frightens, play the sweet keys, Wouldst thou keep them in tune? Labor is rest from the sorrows that greet us, Rest from all petty vexations that meet us, Rest from sin promptings that ever entreat us, Rest from world sirens that lure us to ill. Work, and pure slumbers shall wait on thy pillow, Work, thou shalt ride over care's coming billow, Lie not down wearied neath woe's weeping willow, Work with a stout heart and a resolute will. Labor is health, lo, the husbandman reaping, How through his veins goes the life current leaping, How his strong arm in its stalwart pride sweeping, True as a sunbeam the swift sickle guides. Labor is wealth, in the sea the pearl groweth, Rich the queen's robe from the frail cocoon floweth, From the fine acorn the strong forest bloweth, Temple and statue the marble block hides. Droop not, though shame, sin, and anguish are round thee, Bravely fling off the cold chain that hath bound thee, Look to yon pure heaven smiling beyond thee, Rest not content in thy darkness, a clod, Work for some good, be it ever so slowly. Cherish some flower, be it ever so lowly. Labor, all labor is noble and holy. Let thy great deeds be thy prayer to thy God. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Song of the Lower Classes by Ernest Charles Jones, from the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2. Read for LibriVox.org, by Craig Franklin as the Peasants, Lian Yao as the Miners, Jason in Canada as the Masons, Sonia as the Weavers, and Thomas Peter as the Soldiers. The Song of the Lower Classes We plough and sow, we're so very, very low, that we delve in the dirty clay, till we bless the plain with the golden grain, 
and the veil with the fragrant hay our place we know we're so very low tis down at the landlord's feet we're not too low the bread to grow but too low the bread to eat down down we go we're so very very low to the hell of the deep sunk mines but we gather the proudest gems that glow when the crown of a despot shines and whenever he lacks upon our backs fresh loads he deigns to lay we're far too low to vote the tax but not too low to pay we're low we're low mere rabble we know but at our plastic power the mould at the lordling's feet will grow into palace and church and tower then prostrate fall in the rich man's hall and cringe at the rich man's door we're not too low to build the wall but too low to tread the floor we're low we're low we're very very low yet from our fingers glide the silken flow and the robes that glow round the limbs of the sons of pride and what we get and what we give we know and we know our share we're not too low the cloth to weave but too low the cloth to wear we're low we're low we're very very low and yet when the trumpets ring the thrust of a poor man's arm will go through the heart of the proudest king we're low we're low our place we know we're only the rank and file we're not too low to kill the foe but too low to touch the spoil end of poem this recording is in the public domain the man with the hoe by edwin markham from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part two read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. The Man with the Hoe, written after seeing Millet's world-famous painting. God made man in his own image, in the image of God made he him. Genesis. Bowed by the weight of centuries, he leans upon his hoe and gazes on the ground, the emptiness of ages in his face, and on his back, the burden of the world who made him dead to rapture and despair a thing that grieves not and that never hopes stolid and stunned a brother to the ox who loosened and let down this brutal jaw whose was the hand that slanted back this brow whose breath blew out the light within this brain is this the thing the lord god made and gave to have dominion over sea and land, to trace the stars and search the heavens for power, to feel the passion of eternity. Is this the dream he dreamed, who shaped the suns and marked their ways upon the ancient deep? Down all the stretch of hell to its last gulf, there is no shape more terrible than this, more tongued with censure of the world's blind greed, more filled with signs and portents for the soul, more fraught with menace to the universe. What gulfs between him and the seraphim, slave of the wheel of labor, what to him are Plato and the swing of Pleiades, what the long reaches of the peaks of song, the rift of dawn, the reddening of the rose. Through this dread shape the suffering ages look, time's tragedy is in that aching stoop through this dread shape humanity betrayed plundered profaned and disinherited cries protest to the judges of the world a protest that is also prophecy o oh, masters lords and rulers in all lands is this the handiwork you give to god this monstrous thing distorted and soul quenched how will you ever straighten up this shape touch it again with immortality give back the upward looking and the light rebuild in it the music and the dream make right the immemorial infamies perfidious wrongs immedicable woes 
o masters lords and rulers in all lands how will the future reckon with this man how answer his brute question in that hour when whirlwinds of rebellion shake the world how will it be with kingdoms and with kings with those who shaped him to the thing he is when this dumb terror shall reply to god after the silence of the centuries end of poem this recording is in the public domain the man with the hoe by john vance cheney from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part two read for LibriVox.org by craig franklin as the narrator and sonia s nature the man with the hoe a reply let us a little permit nature to take her own way she better understands her own affairs than we montaigne nature reads not our labels great and small except she one and all who striving win and hold the vacant place all are of royal race him there rough cast with rigid arm and limb the mother moulded him of his rude realm ruler and demigod lord of the rock and clod with nature is no better and no worse on this bared head no curse humbled it is and bowed so is he crowned whose kingdom is the ground diverse the burdens on the one stern road where bears each back its load varied the toil but neither high nor low with pen or sword or hoe he that has put out strength lo he is strong of him with spade or song nature but questions this one shall he stay she answers yea or nay well ill he digs he sings and he bides on or shudders and is gone strength shall we have the toiler strength and grace so fitted to his place as he leaned there on oak where sea winds blow our brother with the hoe no blot no monster no unsightly thing the soil's long lineaged king his changeless realm he knows it and commands erect enough he stands tall as his toil nor does he bow unblessed labour he has and rest need was need is and need will ever be for him and such as he cast for the gap with gnarled arm and limb the mother moulded him long wrought and moulded him with mother's care before she set him there and i she gave him mindful of her own piece of the plant the stone yea since above his work he may not rise she makes the field his skies see she that bore him and meets out the lot he serves her vex him not to scorn the rock whence he was hewn the pit and what was digged from it lest he no more in native virtue stand the earth sword in his hand but follow sorry phantoms to and fro and let a kingdom go end of poem this recording is in the public domain corn law hymn by ebenezer elliot from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part two read for LibriVox.org by jason in canada corn law hymn lord call thy pallid angel the tamer of the strong and bid him whip with want and woe the champions of the wrong oh say not thou to ruin's flood up sluggard why so slow but alone let them groan the lowest of the low and basely beg the bread they curse where millions curse them now no wake not thou the giant who drinks hot blood for wine and shouts unto the east and west in thunder tones like thine till the slow to move rush all at once an avalanche of men while he raves over waves that need no whirlwind then though slow to move moved all at once a sea a sea of men ebenezer elliot 
End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. For All That and All That by Robert Burns From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6 Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter For All That and All That is there for honest poverty why hangs his head and all that the coward slave we pass him by we dare be poor for all that for all that and all that our toils obscure and all that the rank is but the guinea stump the man's a gold for all that but though unhamely fair we dine we're hard and grey and all that he fools their silks and knaves their wine a man's a man for all that for all that and all that their tinsel show and all that the honest man though he'll say poor is king o men for all that you see yon burkey called a lord where struts and stares and all that though hundreds worship at his word he's but a coup for all that for all that and all that his ribbon star and all that the man of independent mind he looks and laughs at all that a prince can mac a belted knight a marquis duke and all that but an honest man's a boon his might good faith he mourn of all that for all that and all that their dignities and all that the pith of sense and pride of worth are higher ranks than all that then let us pray that come it may as come it will for all that that sense and worth or of the earth may bear the gree and all that for all that and all that it's coming yet for all that when man to man the world o'er shall brothers be for all that End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Good Time Coming by Charles Mackay From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada The Good Time Coming There's a good time coming, boys, a good time coming. We may not live to see the day, but earth shall glisten in the ray of the good time coming. Cannonballs may aid the truth, but thought's a weapon stronger. We'll win our battle by its aid. Wait a little longer. There's a good time coming, boys, a good time coming. The pen shall supersede the sword, and right, not might, shall be the Lord in the good time coming. Worth not birth shall rule mankind and be acknowledged stronger the proper impulse has been given wait a little longer there's a good time coming boys a good time coming war in all men's eyes shall be a monster of inequity in the good time coming nations shall not quarrel then to prove which is the stronger nor slaughter men for glory's sake wait a little longer there's a good time coming, boys, a good time coming. Hateful rivalries of creed shall not make their martyrs bleed in the good time coming. Religion shall be shorn of pride and flourish all the stronger, and charity shall trim her lamp, wait a little longer. There's a good time coming, boys, a good time coming, and a poor man's family shall not be his misery in the good time coming. Every child shall be a help to make his right arm stronger. The happier he, the more he has. Wait a little longer. There's a good time coming, boys, 
a good time coming little children shall not toil under or above the soil in the good time coming but shall play in healthful fields till limbs and mind go stronger and every one shall read and write wait a little longer there's a good time coming boys a good time coming the people shall be temperate and shall love instead of hate in the good time coming they shall use and not abuse and make all virtue stronger the reformation has begun wait a little longer there's a good time coming boys a good time coming let us aid it all we can every woman every man the good time coming smallest helps if rightly given make the impulse stronger twill be strong enough one day wait a little longer charles mckay end of poem this recording is in the public domain the lotus eaters by alfred lord tennyson from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part two read for librivox dot org by craig franklin as the narrator lian yao as the first mariner sonia as the second mariner jason in canada as the third mariner and thomas peter as the fourth mariner the lotus eaters one courage he said and pointed toward the land this morning wave shall roll us shoreward soon in the afternoon they came unto a land in which it seemed always afternoon all round the coast the languid air did swoon breathing like one that hath a weary dream full faced above the valley stood the moon and like a downward smoke the slender stream along the cliff to fall and pause and fall did seem two a land of streams some like a downward smoke slow dropping veils of thinnest lawn did go and some through wavering lights and shadows broke rolling a slumbrous sheet of foam below they saw the gleaming river seaward now from the inner land far off three mountain tops three silent pinnacles of aged snow stood sunset flushed and dewed with showery drops up clone the shadowy pine above the woven copse three the charmed sunset lingered low adown in the red west through mounting clefts the dale was seen far inland and the yellow down bordered with palm and many a winding vale and meadow set with slender galingale a land where all things always seemed the same and round about the keel the faces pale dark faces pale against that rosy flame the milk-eyed melancholy lotus-eaters came four branches they bore of that enchanted stem laden with flower and fruit whereof they gave to each but whoso did receive of them and taste to him the gushing of the wave far far away did seem to mourn and rave on alien shores and if his fellow spake his voice was thin as voices from the grave and deep asleep he seemed yet all awake and music in his ears his beating heart did make five they set them down upon the yellow sand between the sun and moon upon the shore and sweet it was to dream of fatherland of child and wife and slave but evermore most weary seemed the sea weary the oar weary the wandering fields of barren foam then someone said we will return no more and all at once they sang our, our island, island home is far beyond, beyond the wave, wave. we, we will, will no longer, longer roam, roam. Coric song one there is sweet music here that softer falls than petals from blown roses on the grass or night dews on still waters between walls of shadowy granite in a gleaming pass music that gentlier on the spirit lies than tired eyelids upon tired eyes music that brings sweet sleep down from the blissful skies here are cool mosses deep and through the moss the ivies creep and in the stream the long-leaved flowers weep 
and from the craggy ledge the poppy hangs in sleep. 2. Why are we weighed upon with heaviness, and utterly consumed with sharp distress, while all things else have rest from weariness? All things have rest, why should we toil alone? We only toil who are the first of things and make perpetual moan, still from one sorrow to another throne, nor ever fold our wings and cease our wanderings, nor steep our brows in slumber's holy balm, nor hearken what the inner spirit sings. There is no joy but calm. Why should we only toil? the roof and crown of things three lo in the middle of the wood the folded leaf is wooed from out the bud with winds upon the branch and there grows green and broad and takes no care sun steeped at noon and in the moon nightly dew fed and turning yellow falls and floats adown the air lo sweetened with the summer light the full-juiced apple, waxing over mellow, drops in a silent autumn night. All its allotted length of days, the flower ripens in its place, ripens and fades, and falls, and hath no toil, fast rooted in the fruitful soil. 4. Hateful is the dark blue sky, vaulted o'er the dark blue sea. Death is the end of life. Ah, why should life all labor be? Let us alone. Time driveth onward fast, And in a little while our lips are dumb. Let us alone. What is it that will last? All things are taken from us, And become portions and parcels of the dreadful past. Let us alone. What pleasure can we have to war with evil? Is there any peace in ever climbing up the climbing wave? All things have rest, and ripen toward the grave. In silence ripen, fall, and cease. Give us long rest or death, dark death of dreamful ease. 5. How sweet it were, hearing the downward stream, with half-shut eyes ever to seem falling asleep in a half-dream to dream and dream like yonder amber light which will not leave the myrrh-bush on the height to hear each other's whispered speech eating the lotus day by day to watch the crisping ripples on the beach and tender curving lines of creamy spray to lend our hearts and spirits wholly to the influence of mild-minded melancholy to muse and brood and live again in memory with those old faces of our infancy heaped over with a mound of grass two handfuls of white dust shot in an urn of brass six dear is the memory of our wedded lives and dear the last embraces of our wives and their warm tears but all hath suffered change for surely now our household hearths are cold, our sons inherit us, our looks are strange, and we should come like ghosts to trouble joy, or else the island princes, overbold, have eat our substance, and the minstrel sings before them of the ten years' war in Troy, and our great deeds as have forgotten things is there confusion in the little isle let what is broken so remain the gods are hard to reconcile tis hard to settle order once again there is confusion worse than death trouble on trouble pain on pain long labour unto aged breath sore task to hearts worn out with many wars and eyes grown dim with gazing on the pilot stars. 7. But propped on beds of amaranth and molly, how sweet, while warm airs lull us, blowing lowly. 
with half dropped eyelids still beneath a heaven dark and holy to watch the long bright river drawing slowly his waters from the purple hill to hear the dewy echoes calling from cave to cave through the thick twined vine to hear the emerald colored water falling through many a woven acanthus wreath divine only to hear and see the far off sparkling brine only to hear where sweet stretched out beneath the pine eight the lotus blooms below the barren peak the lotus blows by every winding creek all day the wind breathes low with mellower tone through every hollow cave and alley lone round and round the spicy downs the yellow lotus dust is blown we have had enough of action and of motion we roll to starboard roll to larboard when the surge was seething free where the wallowing monster spouted his foam fountains in the sea. Let us swear an oath, and keep it with an equal mind, in the hollow lotus land to live and lie reclined, on the hills like gods together, careless of mankind. For they lie beside their nectar, and the bolts are hurled far below them in the valleys, and the clouds are lightly curled round their golden houses, girdled with the gleaming world, where they smile in secret, looking over wasted lands. Blight and famine, plague and earthquake, roaring deeps and fiery sands, clanging fights and flaming towns, and sinking ships and praying hands. But they smile, they find a music centred in a doleful song steaming up, a lamentation and an ancient tale of wrong, like a tale of little meaning, though the words are strong, chanted from an ill-used race of men that cleave the soil, sow the seed and reap the harvest with enduring toil, storing yearly little dews of wheat and wine and oil, till they perish and they suffer, some, tis whispered, down in hell, suffer endless anguish. Others in Elysian valleys dwell, resting weary limbs at last on beds of asphodel. Surely, surely, slumber is more sweet than toil, the shore than labor in the deep mid-ocean, wind and wave and oar. O oh, rest ye, brother mariners, we will not wander more. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Delay by Charlotte Fisk Bates From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin Delay I do affirm that thou hast saved the race as much as thou hast ever made it lose. Men of quick action may thy name abuse, but the world's life and theirs attest thy grace. An hour of thee doth sometimes turn the face of men and kingdoms, bidding them refuse what, chosen last, it had been death to choose. Through thee alone they missed the fatal place. How often dies the guileful thought or end when guileless eyes detain us on our way. What sin and shame that hindrance may forfend, which we so hate and storm against today. What mighty evils over all impend, averted graciously by kind delay. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Happy Heart, from Patient Gristle, Act One, Scene One, by Thomas Decker, from the World's Best Poetry, Volume Six, Fancy and Sentiment, Part Two, read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter. The Happy Heart, from Patient Gristle, Act One, Scene One. Art thou poor, yet hast thou golden slumbers, O sweet content. Art thou rich, 
yet is thy mind perplexed. O oh, punishment! Dost thou laugh to see how fools are vexed to add to golden numbers, golden numbers? O oh, sweet content, O oh, sweet, O oh, sweet content! Work apace, 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 Honest labor bears a lovely face. Then hey, nonny, nonny, hey, nonny, nonny. Canst drink the waters of the crisped spring, O oh, sweet content. Swimst thou in wealth, yet sinkst in thine own tears, O oh, punishment. Then he that patiently wants burden bears, No burden bears, but is a king. A king, O oh, sweet content, O oh, sweet, O oh, sweet content, work a pace, a pace, a pace, a pace, honest labor bears a lovely face, then hey, nonny, nonny, hey, nonny, nonny. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Cobbler and the Financier by Jean de La Fontaine, translated from the French by Eliza Wright, from the World's Best Poetry, Volume Six, Fancy and Sentiment, Part Two, read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada as the narrator, Thomas Peter as the Financier, and Craig Franklin as the Cobbler. The Cobbler and the Financier. A cobbler sang from morn till night. "'Twas sweet and marvellous to hear. "'His trills and quavers told the ear "'of more contentment and delight "'enjoyed by that laborious wight "'than e'er enjoyed the sages seven "'or any mortals short of heaven. "'His neighbour, on the other hand, "'with gold in plenty at command, "'but little sang and slumbered less, "'a financier of great success. "'If e'er he dozed at break of day, the cobbler's song drove sleep away, and much he wished that heaven had made sleep a commodity of trade, in markets sold like food and drink, so much an hour, so much a wink. At last our songster did he call to meet him in his princely hall. Said he, Now, honest Gregory, what may your yearly earnings be? My yearly earnings, faith, good sir, I never go at once so far, the cheerful cobbler said, and queerly scratched his head. I never reckon in that way, but cobble on from day to day, content with daily bread. Indeed. Well, Gregory, pray, what may your earnings be per day? Why, sometimes more and sometimes less, the worst of all, I must confess, and but for which our gains would be a pretty sight indeed to see is that the days are made so many in which we cannot earn a penny. The sorest ill the poor man feels, they tread upon each other's heels, those idle days of holy saints. And though the year is shingled o'er, the parson keeps a finding more. With smile provoked by these complaints, replied the lordly financier, I'll give you better cause to sing. These hundred pounds I hand you here, will make you happy as a king. Go, spend them with a frugal heed. They'll long supply your every need. The cobbler thought the silver more than he had ever dreamed before the mines for ages could produce, or world with all its people's use. He took it home, and there did hide, and with it laid his joy aside. No more of song, no more of sleep, but cares, suspicions in their stead, and false alarms by fancy fed. His eyes and ears their vigils keep, and not a cat can tread the floor but seems a thief slipped through the door. At last, poor man, up to the financier he ran, then in his morning nap profound. Oh, give me back my songs, cried he, and sleep that you so sweet to be and take the money every pound. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Labour Done from Song of the Bell by J. C. Frederick von Schiller From the translation 
of Samuel Atkins Elliot. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2. Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin. Labour Done. Let us with care observe what from our strength yet weakness springs, for he respect can ne'er deserve who hands alone to labour brings. Tis only this which honours man, his mind with heavenly fire was warmed, that he with deepest thought might scan the work which his own hand has formed. Cheerful in the forest's gloom, the wanderer turns his weary steps to his loved though lowly home, bleating flocks draw near the fold and the herds, wide-horned and smooth, slow pacing come, lowing from the hill, the accustomed stall to fill, heavy rolls along the wagon, richly loaded, on the sheaves with gayest leaves, they form the wreath, and the youthful reapers dance upon the heath, street and market all are quiet, and round each domestic light gathers now a circle fond, while shuts the creaking city gate, darkness hovers o'er the earth, safely still each sleeper covers, as with light, that the deed of crime discovers, for wakes the law's protecting might. Holy order, rich with all, the gifts of heaven that best we call, freedom, peace, and equal laws, of common good the happy cause. She, the savage man, has taught what the arts of life have wrought, changing the rude hut to comfort splendour, and filled fierce hearts with feelings tender. And yet a dearer bond she wove, our home, our country taught to love. A thousand active hands combined for mutual aid with zealous heart, in well-apportioned labour find their power increasing with their art. Master and workman all agree under sweet freedom's holy care, and each content in his degree warns every scorner to beware. Labour is the poor man's pride, success by toil alone is won. King's glory in possessions wide, we glory in our work well done. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Haste Not, Rest Not by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe Translated from German From The World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada Haste not, rest not. Ohne hast, ohne rast. Without haste, without rest, Bind the motto to thy breast. Bear it with thee as a spell, Storm and sunshine guard it well. Heed not flowers that round thee bloom, Bear it onward to the tomb. Haste not, let no thoughtless deed Mar for I the spirit's seed. Ponder well, and know the right, onward then with all thy might. Haste not, years can ne'er atone for one reckless action done. Rest not, life is sweeping by, go and dare before you die. Something mighty and sublime leave behind to conquer time. Glorious tis to live for I when these forms have passed away. Haste not, rest not, calmly wait, meekly bear the storms of fate. Duty be thy polar guide, do the right, whate'er betide. Haste not, rest not, conflicts past, God shall crown thy work at last. From the German of Johann Wolfgang von Goethe End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Work by Henry Van Dyke From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, 
Fancy and Sentiment, Part Two. Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin. Work. Let me but do my work from day to day, in field or forest, at the desk or loom, in roaring market place or tranquil room. Let me but find it in my heart to say. When vagrant wishes beckon me astray, this is my work, my blessing, not my doom. Of all who live, I am the one by whom this work can best be done in the right way. Then shall I see it not too great nor small to suit my spirit and to prove my powers. Then shall I cheerful greet the labouring hours and cheerful turn when the long shadows fall at eventide to play and love and rest because I know, for me, my work is best. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Wish by Abraham Cowley From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada A Wish this only grant me that my means may lie too low for envy, for contempt too high. Some honor I would have, not from great deeds, but good alone. The unknown are better than ill-known. Rumor can ope the grave. Acquaintance I would have, but went depends not on the number, but on the choice of friends. Books should, not business, entertain the light, and sleep as undisturbed as death the night. My house a cottage more than palace, and should fitting be for all my use, no luxury. My garden painted o'er with nature's hand, not arts, and pleasures yield, Horace might envy in his saving field. Thus would I double my life's fading space, for he that runs it well twice runs his race. And in this true delight, these unbought sports, this happy state, I would not fear, nor wish my fate, but boldly say each night, Tomorrow let my sun his beams display, or in clouds hide them, I have lived today. Abraham Cowley End of Poem This recording is in the public domain. Contentment by Joshua Sylvester From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia Contentment I weigh not fortune's frown or smile I joy not much in earthly joys I seek not state, I reck not style I am not fond of fancy's toys I rest so pleased with what I have I wish no more, no more I crave. I quake not at the thunder's crack, I tremble not at news of war, I swound not at the news of wreck, I shrink not at the blazing star, I fear not loss, I hope not gain, I envy none, I none disdain. I see ambition never pleased, I see some tantals starved in store, I see gold's dropsy seldom eased, I see even Midas gape for more, I neither want nor yet abound, Enough's a feast, content is crowned. I feign not friendship where I hate, I fawn not on the great in show, I prize, I praise a mean estate, Neither too lofty nor too low. This, this is all my choice, my cheer, a mind content, a conscience clear. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Content from Farewell to Folly, 1617, by Robert Greene. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2. Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia. Content from Farewell to Folly, 
1617. Sweet are the thoughts that savor of content. The quiet mind is richer than a crown. Sweet are the nights in careless slumber spent. The poor estate scorns fortune's angry frown. Such sweet content, such minds, such sleep, such bliss. Beggars enjoy when princes oft do miss. The homely house that harbors quiet rest, the cottage that affords no pride or care, the mean that grees with country music best, the sweet consort of mirth and music's fair. Obscured life sets down a type of bliss, a mind content, both crown and kingdom is. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Song by John Bunyan From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada Song He that is down need fear no fall, He that is low no pride, He that is humble ever shall have God to be his guide. I am content with what I have, Little be it or much, And Lord, contentment still I crave, Because thou savest such. Fullness to such a burden is that I go on pilgrimage. Here little and hereafter bliss is best from age to age. John Bunyan End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. In Prison by Sir Roger Lestrange From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6 Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin In Prison Beat on, proud billows, boreas blow, Swell curled waves high on Jove's roof, Your incivility doth show That innocence is tempest-proof. Though surely nearest frown my thoughts are calm, Then strike affliction, for thy wounds are balm. That which the world miscalls a jail, a private closet is to me. Whilst a good conscience is my bail, an innocence my liberty. Locks, bars, and solitude together met, make me no prisoner but an anchoret. I, whilst I wished to be retired, into this private room was turned, as if their wisdoms had conspired, the salamander, should be burned, or like those sophists that would drown a fish, I am constrained to suffer what I wish. The cynic loves his poverty, the pelican her wilderness, and tis the Indian's pride to be naked on frozen Caucasus. Contentment cannot smart, Stoics we see, make torments easier to their apathy. These manacles upon my arms I as my mistress favours wear, And for to keep my ankles warm I have some iron shackles there. These walls are but my garrison, This cell which men call jail Doth prove my citadel. I'm in the cabinet locked up, Like some high-prized Margaret, Or like the great mogul or pope, Am cloistered up from public sight, Retiredness is a piece of majesty, And thus proud sultan, I'm as good as thee. End of recording. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Cleon and I by Charles Mackay from the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2. Read for LibriVox.org by Jason in Canada. Cleon and I. Cleon hath a million acres, ne'er a one have I. Cleon dwelleth in a palace, in a cottage I. Cleon hath a dozen fortunes, 
not a penny I. Yet the poorer of the twain is Cleon, and not I. Cleon true possesseth acres, but the landscape I. Half the charms to me it yieldeth money cannot buy. Cleon harbors sloth and dullness, freshening vigor I. He in velvet, I in fustian, richer man am I. Cleon is a slave to grandeur, free as thought am I. Cleon fees a score of doctors, need of none have I. Wealth surrounded, care environed, Cleon fears to die. Death may come, he'll find me readier, happier man am I. Cleon sees no charms in nature, in a daisy I. Cleon hears no anthems ringing in the sea and sky. Nature sings to me forever, earnest listener I. State for state, with all attendance, who would change? Not I. Charles Mackay End of Poem This recording is in the public domain. The Wants of Man by John Quincy Adams From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6 Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter The Wants of Man Man wants but little here below, Nor wants that little long. Tis not with me exactly so, But tis so in the song. My wants are many, and if told, would muster many a score, and were each wish a mint of gold, I still should long for more. What first I want is daily bread, and canvas backs, and wine, and all the realms of nature spread before me when I dine. Four courses scarcely can provide my appetite to quell, with four choice cooks from France beside, to dress my dinner well. What next I want, at princely cost, is elegant attire, black sable furs for winter's frost, and silks for summer's fire, and cashmere shawls, and Brussels lace, my bosom's front to deck, and diamond rings my hands to grace, and rubies for my neck. I want, who does not want, a wife, affectionate and fair, to solace all the woes of life, and all his joys to share. Of temper sweet, of yielding will, of firm yet placid mind, with all my faults to love me still, with sentiment refined. And as time's car incessant runs, and fortune fills my store, I want of daughters and of sons, from eight to half a score. I want Alas, can mortal dare such bliss on earth to crave, That all the girls be chaste and fair, The boys all wise and brave. I want a warm and faithful friend To cheer the adverse hour, Who ne'er to flatter will descend, Nor bend the knee to power. A friend to chide me when I'm wrong, My inmost soul to see, And that my friendship prove as strong for him As his for me. I want the seals of power and place, the ensigns of command, charged by the people's unbought grace to rule my native land. Nor crown nor scepter would I ask, but from my country's will, by day, by night to ply the task, her cup of bliss to fill. I want the voice of honest praise to follow me behind, and to be thought in future days the friend of humankind that after ages, as they rise, exulting may proclaim, in choral union to the skies, their blessings on my name. These are the wants of mortal man. I cannot want them long, for life itself is but a span, and earthly bliss a song. My last great want, absorbing all, is, when beneath the sod, and summoned to my final call, the mercy of my God. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain.
Contentment by Oliver Wendell Holmes From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia Contentment Man wants but little here below Little, I ask, my wants of you I only wish a hut of stone A very plain brown stone will do That I may call my own and close at hand is such a one in yonder street that fronts the sun plain food is quite enough for me three courses are as good as ten if nature can subsist on three thank heaven for three amen i always thought cold victual nice my choice would be vanilla eyes i care not much for gold or land give me a mortgage here and there some good bank stock some note of hand or trifling railroad share i only ask that fortune send a little more than i shall spend honours are silly toys i know and titles are but empty names i would perhaps be plenipo but only near st james i'm very sure i should not care to fill our governator's chair jewels are baubles tis a sin to care for such unfruitful things one good-sized diamond in a pin, some not so large in rings, a ruby and a pearl or so will do for me. I laugh at show. My dame should dress in cheap attire. Good heavy silks are never dear. I own perhaps I might desire some shawls of true cashmere, some marrowy crepes of china silk, like wrinkled skins on scalded milk. I would not have the horse I drive so fast that folks must stop and stare. An easy gait, 245, suits me. I do not care. Perhaps for just a single spurt, some seconds less would do no hurt. Of pictures, I should like to own Titian's and Raphael's three or four. I love so much their style and tone. One turner and no more. A landscape foreground golden dirt the sunshine painted with a squirt of books but few some fifty score for daily use and bound for wear the rest upon an upper floor some little luxury there of red morocco's gilded gleam and vellum rich as country cream busts cameos gems such things as these which others often show for pride i value for their power to please and selfish churls deride one stradivarius i confess two meerschaums i would fain possess wealth wasteful tricks i will not learn nor ape the glittering upstart fool shall not carved tables serve my turn but all must be of bool give grasping pomp its double share i ask but one recumbent chair thus humble let me live and die nor long for midas golden touch if heaven more generous gifts deny i shall not miss them much too grateful for the blessing lent of simple tastes and mind content end of poem this recording is in the public domain Ulysses by Alfred Lord Tennyson From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6 Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter Ulysses It little profits that An idle king By this still hearth Among these barren crags Matched with an aged wife I meet and dole unequal laws unto a savage race that hoard and sleep and feed and know not me. I cannot rest from travel. I will drink life to the lees. All times I have enjoyed greatly, have suffered greatly, both with those that loved me and alone. On shore, and when through scudding drifts the rainy Hyades vex the dim sea, I am become a name, for always roaming with a hungry heart, much have I seen and known, 
cities of men and manners, climates, councils, governments, myself not least, but honored of them all, and drunk delight of battle with my peers, far on the ringing plains of windy Troy. I am a part of all that I have met, yet all experience is an arch where through gleams that untraveled world, whose margin fades forever and forever when I move. How dull it is to pause, to make an end, to rust unburnished, not to shine in use, as though to breathe were life. Life piled on life for all too little, and of one to me little remains. But every hour is saved from that eternal silence, something more, a bringer of new things. And vile it were for some three sons to store and hoard myself, And this grey spirit yearning in desire to follow knowledge, Like a sinking star, beyond the utmost bound of human thought. This is my son, mine own Telemachus, To whom I leave the sceptre and the isle, Well loved of me, discerning to fulfil this labour, By slow prudence to make mild a rugged people, and through soft degrees subdue them to the useful and the good. Most blameless is he, centred in the sphere of common duties, decent not to fail in offices of tenderness, and pay meet adoration to my household gods when I am gone. He works his work, I mine. There lies the port, the vessel puffs her sail, there gloom the dark broad seas, my mariners, souls that have toiled, and wrought, and thought with me, that ever with a frolic welcome took the thunder and the sunshine, and opposed free hearts, free foreheads. You and I are old. Old age hath yet his honour and his toil. Death closes all. But something... Ere the end, some work of noble note may yet be done, not unbecoming men that strove with gods. The lights begin to twinkle from the rocks, the long day wanes, the slow moon climbs, the deep moans round with many voices. Come, my friends, tis not too late to seek a newer world. Push off and sitting well in order smite the sounding furrows, for my purpose holds to sail beyond the sunset and the baths of all the western stars, until I die. It may be that the gulfs will wash us down. It may be we shall touch the happy isles and see the great Achilles whom we knew. Though much is taken, much abides. And though we are not now that strength which in old days moved earth and heaven, that which we are, we are. One equal temper of heroic hearts, made weak by time and fate, but strong in will to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. To All in Haven by Philip Bork Marston From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin To All in Haven All ye who have gained the haven of safe days And rest at ease your wanderings being done Except the last inevitable one be well content, I say, and hear men's praise. Yet in the quiet of your sheltered bays, Blend waters shining in on equal sun, Forget not that the awful storm-tides run In far, unsheltered and tempestuous ways. Remember near what rocks and through what shoals Worn, desperate mariners strain with all their might, they may not come to your sweet restful goals, Your waters placid in the level light. 
their graves wait in that sea no moon controls that is in dreadful fellowship with night end of poem this recording is in the public domain a woman's wish by mary ashley townsend from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part two read for LibriVox.org by Leanne Yao. A Woman's Wish Would I were lying in a field of clover, of clover cool and soft and soft and sweet, with dusky clouds on deep skies hanging over, and scented silence at my head and feet. Just for one hour to slip the leash of worry in eager haste from thought's impatient neck, and watch it coursing in its heedless hurry, Disdaining wisdom's call or duty's back. Oh, it were sweet, where clover clumps are meeting, And daisies hiding, so to hide and rest. No sound except my own heart's steady beating, Rocking itself to sleep within my breast. Just to lie there, filled with the deeper breathing That comes of listening to a wild bird's song. Our souls require at times this full unsheathing, all swords will rust if scabbard kept too long. And I am tired, so tired of rigid duty, so tired of all my tired hands find to do. I yearn, I faint, for some of life's free beauty, its loose beads with no straight string running through. I laugh, if laugh you will, at my crude speech, but women sometimes die of such greed, Die for the small joys held beyond their reach, and the assurance they have all they need. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The World and the Quietist by Matthew Arnold From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Sonia as the narrator and Jason in Canada as Critias The World and the Quietist Why, when the world's great mind hath finally inclined, why you say, Critias be debating still why, with these mournful rhymes learned in more languid climes blame our activity who with such passionate will are what we mean to be critias long since i know for fate decreed it so long since the world hath set its heart to live long since with credulous zeal it turns life's mighty wheel still doth for labourers send who still their labour give and still expects an end yet as the wheel flies round with no ungrateful sound do adverse voices fall on the world's ear deafened by his own stir the rugged labourer caught not till then a sense so glowing and so near of his omnipotence so when the feast grew loud in susa's palace proud a white-robed slave stole to the great king's side he spake the great king heard felt the slow rolling word swell his attentive soul breathed deeply as it died and drained his mighty bowl end of poem this recording is in the public domain Rest by Margaret L. Woods From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6 Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter Rest To spend the long warm days Silent beside the silent stealing streams To see, not gaze To hear, not listen Thoughts exchanged for dreams. See clouds that slowly pass, Trailing their shadows o'er the far faint down, 
and ripening grass, while yet the meadows wear their starry crown. To hear the breezes sigh, cool in the silver leaves like falling rain, pause and go by, tired wanderers o'er the solitary plain. See far from all affright, shy river creatures play hour after hour, and night by night, low in the west, the white moon's folding flower. Thus lost to human things, to blend at last with nature, and to hear what songs she sings, low to herself, when there is no one near. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Invocation to Sleep by John Fletcher From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao Invocation to Sleep from Valentinian Come, sleep, and with thy sweet deceiving Lock me in delight a while. Let some pleasing dreams beguile all my fancies, That from thence I may feel an influence, All my powers of care bereaving. Though but a shadow, but a sliding, let me know some little joy. We that suffer long annoy are contented with a thought, through an idle fancy wrought. Oh, let my joys have some abiding. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sleep by Dr. John Walcott from The World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2. Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao. Sleep. Come, gentle sleep, attend thy votary's prayer, and though death's image to my couch repair. How sweet, though lifeless, yet with life to lie, and without dying, oh, how sweet to die. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sleep from Astrophel and Stella by Sir Philip Sidney From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6 Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter Sleep from Astrophel and Stella Come, sleep. O oh, sleep, the certain knot of peace, the baiting place of wit, the balm of woe, the poor man's wealth, the prisoner's release, the indifferent judge between the high and low, with shield of proof, shield me from out the prease of those fierce darts despair at me doth throw. Oh, make me in those civil wars to cease. I will good tribute pay if thou do so. Take thou of me smooth pillows, sweetest bed, a chamber deaf to noise and blind to light, a rosy garland and a weary head. And if these things, as being thine in right, move not thy heavy grace, thou shalt in me Livelier than elsewhere, Stella's image see. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sleep from Second Part of Henry the Fourth, Act Three, Scene One, by William Shakespeare. From the World's Best Poetry, Volume Six, Fancy and Sentiment, Part Two. Read for LibriVox.org by Thomas Peter Sleep from Second Part of Henry the Fourth, Act Three, Scene One King Henry How many thousands of my poorest subjects are at this hour asleep? O oh, sleep, O oh, gentle sleep, nature's soft nurse, how have I frighted thee? that thou no more wilt weigh my eyelids down and steep my senses in forgetfulness. 
why rather sleep? Liest thou in smoky cribs upon uneasy pallets stretching thee, and hushed with buzzing night flies to thy slumber, than in the perfumed chambers of the great, under the canopies of costly state, and lulled with sounds of sweetest melody? O oh, thou dull God, why liest thou with the vile in loathsome beds? And leaves the kingly couch a watch case or a common larum bell. Wilt thou upon the high and giddy mast seal up the ship boy's eyes and rock his brains in cradle of the rude imperious surge, and in the visitation of the winds who take the ruffian billows by the top, curling their monstrous heads and hanging them with deafening clamours in the slippery clouds that with the hurly death itself awakes canst thou o oh partial sleep give thy repose to the wet sea-boy in an hour so rude and in the calmest and most stillest night with all appliances and means to boot tonight to a king then happy low lie down Uneasy lies the head that wears a crown. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Sleeplessness by William Wordsworth From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org by Lian Yao Sleeplessness a flock of sheep that leisurely pass by, one after one. The sound of rain and bees murmuring. The fall of rivers, winds and seas. Smooth fields, white sheets of water and pure sky. I've thought of all by turns, and still I lie sleepless. And soon the small birds' melodies must hear, first uttered from my orchard trees, and the first cuckoo's melancholy cry. Even thus, last night, and two nights more I lay, and could not win thee sleep by any stealth. So do not let me wear to-night away. Without thee, what is all the morning's wealth? Come, blessed barrier between day and day, dear mother of fresh thoughts and joyous health. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Watching in Burma by Evely Chubbuck Judson from the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2. Read for LibriVox.org by Craig Franklin. Watching in Burma. Sleep, love, sleep. The dusty day is done. Lo, from afar the freshening breezes sweep wide over groves of balm. Down from the towering palm, in at the open casement cooling run, And round thy lowly bed, thy bed of pain, Bathing thy patient head, like grateful showers of rain, they come. While the white curtains waving to and fro fan the sick air, And pityingly the shadows come and go, with gentle human care, Compassionate and dumb. The dusty day is done, the night begun, while prayerful watch I keep, sleep, love, sleep. Is there no magic in the touch of fingers thou dost love so much? Fain would they scatter poppies o'er thee now, or with its mute caress, the tremulous lips some soft nepenthe press upon thy weary lid and aching brow, while prayerful watch I keep, sleep, love, sleep. On the pagoda spire the bells are swinging, Their little golden circlet in a flutter, With tales the wooing winds have dared to utter, Till all are ringing as if a choir Of golden-nested birds in heaven were singing, And with a lulling sound the music floats around, And drops like balm into the drowsy ear, Commingling with the hum of the sepoy's distant drum, And the lazy beetle ever droning near, Sounds these of deepest silence born, Like night made visible by morn, 
so silent that i sometimes start to hear the throbbing of my heart and watch with shivering sense of pain to see thy pale lids lift again the lizard with his mouse-like eyes peeps from the mortise in surprise at such strange quiet after day's harsh din then boldly ventures out and looks about and with his hollow feet treads his small evening beat darting upon his prey in such a tricky winsome sort of way his delicate marauding seems no sin and still the curtains swing but noiselessly the bells a melancholy murmur ring as tears were in the sky more heavily the shadows fall like the black foldings of a pall where juts the rough beam from the wall the candles flare with fresher gusts of air the beetle's drone turns to a dirge-like solitary moan night deepens and i sit in cheerless doubt alone end of poem this recording is in the public domain the voyage of sleep by arthur wentworth eaton from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part two read for librivox dot org by sonia the voyage of sleep to sleep i give myself away unclasp the fetters of the mind forget the sorrows of the day the burdens of the heart unbind with empty sail this tired bark drifts out upon the sea of rest while all the shore behind grows dark and silence reigns from east to west at last awakes the hidden breeze that bears me to the land of dreams where music sighs among the trees and murmurs in the winding streams o oh, weary day o oh, weary day that dawns in fear and ends in strife that brings no cooling draught to allay the burning fever thirst of life o oh, sacred night when angel hands are pressed upon the throbbing brow and when the soul on shining sands descends with angels from the prow and sees soft skies and meadows sweet and blossoming lanes that wind and wind to bowers where friends long parted meet and sit again with arms entwined and catch the perfumed breeze that blows from pink-plumed orchards sloping fair and every fresh expanding rose that throws sweet kisses to the air o sacred night o silvery shore o blossoming lanes that wind and wind ye are my refuge more and more from ghosts that haunt the waking mind to sleep i give myself away forget the visions of unrest that came through all the clamorous day and drift into the silent west end of poem this recording is in the public domain the two oceans by john sterling from the world's best poetry volume six fancy and sentiment part two read for librivox dot org by sonia the two oceans two seas amid the night in the moonshine roll and sparkle now spread in the silver light now sadden and wail and darkle the one has a billowy motion and from land to land it gleams the other is sleep's wide ocean and its glimmering waves are dreams the one with murmur and roar bears fleets around coast and islet the other without a shore never knew the track of a pilot end of poem this recording is in the public domain Ode to Sleep by Paul Hamilton Hayne. 
From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2, read for LibriVox.org, by Thomas Peter. Ode to Sleep Beyond the sunset and the amber sea, to the lone depths of ether, cold and bare, thy influence, soul of all tranquillity, hallows the earth and awes the reverent air. Yon laughing rivulet quells its silvery tune. The pines, like priestly watchers tall and grim, Stand mute against the pensive twilight dim, Breathless to hail the advent of the moon. From the white beach the ocean falls away coyly, And with a thrill. The seabirds dart ghost-like from out the distance, And depart with a grey fleetness, Moaning the dead day. The wings of silence, over folding space, Droop with dusk grandeur from the heavenly steep, And through the stillness gleams thy starry face. Serenest angel, sleep. Come, woo me here, amid these flowery charms. Breathe on my eyelids, press thy odorous lips close to mine own, And wreathe me in thine arms, and cloud my spirit with thy sweet eclipse. No dreams, no dreams, keep back the motley throng, For such are girded round with ghastly might, And sing low burdens of despondent song, Decked in the mockery of a lost delight. I ask oblivion's balsam, The mute peace toned to still breathings, And the gentlest sighs. Not music woven of rarest harmonies Could yield me such elysium of release. The tones of earth are weariness, Not only mid the loud mart, And in the walks of trade, But where the mountain genius broodeth lonely, In the cool pulsing of the sylvan shade. Then bear me far into thy noiseless land, Surround me with thy silence, deep on deep, until serene I stand close by a duskier country, And more grand mysterious solitude than thine, O sleep. As he whose veins a feverous frenzy burns, Whose life-blood withers in the fiery drouth, Feebly and with a languid longing turns To the spring breezes gathering from the south, So, feebly and with languid longing, I turn to thy wished Nepenthe, and implore the golden dimness, the purpureal gloom which haunt thy poppied realm, and make the shore of thy dominion balmy with all bloom. In the clear gulfs of thy serene profound, worn passions sink to quiet, sorrows pause, suddenly fainting to still breathed rest. Thou own'st a magical atmosphere Which awes the memory seething in the turbulent breast, Which, muffling up the sharpness of all sound of mortal lamentation, Solely bears the silvery minor toning of our woe, All mellow to harmonious underflow, Soft as the sad farewells of dying years, Lulling as sunset showers that veil the west, and sweet as love's last tears, When overwhelling hearts do mutely weep. O griefs, O wailings, your tempestuous madness, Merged in a regal quietude of sadness, Wins a strange glory by the streams of sleep. Then woo me here, amid these flowery charms, Breathe on my eyelids, press thy odorous lips close to mine own, Enfold me in thine arms, and cloud my spirit with thy sweet eclipse. And while from waning depth to depth I fall, Down lapsing to the utmost depths of all, Till wan forgetfulness obscurely stealing Creeps like an incantation on the soul, And o'er the slow ebb of my conscious life Dies the thin flush of the last conscious feeling, And like abortive thunder, the dull roll of sullen passions ebbs far, far away. O oh, angel, loose the cords which cling to strife, 
sever the gossamer bondage of my breath, and let me pass, gently as winds in May, from the dim realm which owns thy shadowy sway, to thy diviner sleep, O sacred death. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Fallen by John Vance Cheney From the World's Best Poetry, Volume 6 Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2 Read for LibriVox.org By Thomas Peter as the narrator And Jason in Canada as The Voices The Fallen In Memoriam, May 30th 1. Toll the slow bell Toll the low bell Toll, toll, make dole for them that wrought so well. Come, come, with muffled drum and wailing lorn of dolorous horn. The solemn measure slow, toll and beat and blow. Put out all glories that adorn the sweet unheeding morn. Come, come, to the muffled drum and the sad horns bring flowers for them that took the thorns now now let the slow bell be struck and the troubled drum come come the solemn measure slow toll and beat and blow rebuke this bright unpitying light the solemn measure slow Toll and beat and blow, for them our beauty and our might, Gone on the unreturning way, for them that took the night, That we might have the day. 2. Hark! Voices, joyous voices break from the green martyr mounds. Wake, wake! The Lord our God, once more he saith, this hand made all it made, not death. Let the blithe bells ring and the May air sing. Strike the quick drum, smite sorrow dumb. Blow the glad horn, this glad May morn. Lift the valiant measures high of the proud earth and sky for them that tent beyond the firmament and on the field of light still gather to the fight. Blow the glad horn, this glad May morn stanch undaunted measures blow gathering courage as they go valiant measures high caroled at earth and sky set bright triumphal stave for them that fought so well that faltered not nor fell for them and all where so yon colors wave unto the four winds given and the proud earth and heaven there believe and battle they whose face is toward the day the ever-living light, where is no night, where is no death, nor shadow of the grave. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. End of The World's Best Poetry, Volume 6, Fancy and Sentiment, Part 2.